It's always downhill from here. Yeah. <laughs> or uphill, depending on like what your situation is. You could be going uphill as far as advancement and climbing oh, to the top. Or downhill that's... if you just want it to be easy. No, I think I think you're right. I think I'm mixing them up. Oh, no, I, I don't think there is one right way. I think they got mixed up so many times I that like colloquially... A... No, I meant like the quality of our pen cast is is all downhill from here. At whatever point we're at, it's it's going downhill. Right, but that's my point. It's like maybe downhill is good. I mean, downhill is easier. Yeah, but it also can develop <laughs> momentum challenges, and you could end up uh, hmm. flopping down a ski slope like a bottom weighted scarecrow, like I did. Sounds uh, like you're speaking from personal experience. Let's get into it, Charlie. Let's actually let's get recording. into it. Let's do the recording. <laughs> yes. Welcome everyone to episode number thirty-five of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown, and we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. I'm playing with the rhythm on the intro today a little bit. I don't know, 35 times, Drew, kind of mixing it up. Still don't have it memorized. Playing with a ribbon? The, the rhythm, the rhythm. Oh, the rhythm, the Sorry. tempo. I'm like, I'm like, I was like, what does it mean when you play with a ribbon? Is that like a... Like a ribbon dancer? Remember that? I don't know. Okay. From the yeah. early 90s? <laughs> yes, I do. Rachel knows the entire song. She probably wants to sing it right now if she heard me <laughs> re reference it. Little, little shout out to you 90s children. Uh, anyway, in today's show, we're gonna be speaking about, we're, we're going to be speaking about Sailor Bespoke, Shimmer Ink Dislodging from Paper, Fude Nibs, and Reverse Writing, among some other things. A various smorgasbord of topics today. Schmor smorgasbord? A cornucopia. Board. Cornucopia. That's better. Is it smorgasbord or smorgasborg? I like think it's it end in a D or a G? Smorgasborg. I don't know. I don't think it's borg. Smorg? Smorg. I'm trying to think of All, all I can like think of is Star Trek. Web. Like a borg from Star uh, This. None of this matters. This is where we are with the pencast these days. If you're listening at this point, 35 episodes in, you know what you're in for, right? But anyway, that was our intro. Now we're going to start out with some feedback. We got some good stuff this week, Brian. Um, we did a new Quick Draw video, Brian, a sequel to mm -hmm. the Quick Draw Fountain Pen Countdown of 2015, in which Brian and myself dressed up like pseudo cowboys and uh, I fell on the ground. Um, so that was fun to revisit that intro, but we also revisited a list of quick draw pens, pens that are very easily accessible, good for on the go, things like that. And a lot of the feedback from that video, Brian, I wanted to mention because there were a lot of people that thought we had a tragic oversight because mm. we did not include the Lamy Safari on that list. So mm. is the Lamy Safari a tried and true quick draw pen? And should should we yeah. have added it? I, I, I think mean, absolutely. That, I think there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of pens that we could have put on this list. We just we're trying not to have like a 34 pen list, right? Yeah. Like I, I could easily say that a Safari is a quick draw pen. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good, and it's very durable. Very durable. Mm, very so, true. So yeah, that one that one could be added. You know mm -hmm. what else, Brian? We oh. could have added on our oversized pen countdown, which was oh a which was part of a pen cast question mm -hmm. that we then sliced out and made it its own video. Okay. A lot of mentions of Opus 88 as yeah. ginormous pens. Yeah, and the big demonstrator, yep. Yeah, I think one of us should have mentioned that one in the list. I, I, I added mm. a Diplomat Arrow and in retrospect, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, it's an unconventionally sized pen in the hand, mm. which is why I added it. But I think if I could go back in time, I'd swap that one for an Opus 88. It's a good point. Yeah. yeah. You know what? We're That's not a solid uh, one. We're not yeah. infallible here. You know? No, no, no. But I wanted to mention that because I thought it was mm. really good. It's a good point. And we also got a little chunk of feedback on YouTube from Clark uh, Bill Grav. And he says, Drew, glad you enjoyed Red Dead Redemption 2, the game I've been playing um, that I mentioned last week. My cousin Roger Clark played Arthur Morgan. That's the main character, Brian. In, That's the guy in Red Dead Redemption 2. It's a video game? 
Yes. I he told you about it last him? week when I'm when I told you how excited I was about walking around and drinking my coffee. Uh huh. You were clearly listening and. No, I was listening, but this is a video game. He says he his cousin played him. Well, his the the voice actor. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I was thinking yeah. like an, I was thinking that like was it based on a movie or something? Well, sometimes sometimes actors do lend their voice and their face their to video pers games. Personage. This, this yeah. was not one of them, but um. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you no. voice that. So Arthur Morgan. Wait, is that the character? Or is the that characters the... are uh, Roger Clark is the voice actor who won like oh, awards oh, okay. for this performance because his performance was like Oscar worthy. It was tremendous. Hmm. Very Fantastic. cool. So so yeah, very excited to hear that from. That's pretty awesome. Sounds like yes. we need to have. Sounds like we need to have Roger Clark on the pencast. No, I'm just kidding. We're Casual not... and extraneous, superfluous <laughs> and extemporaneous. Oh that'd be man, awesome. that'd be great. <laughs> that'd, that'd be, be so awesome. Great. Yeah. Sure. I, I, would say, I would sit one out. I'd sit one out. Let him. Let him do it. My brother and I always uh, emulate him whenever we want to say sure because Arthur Arthur Morgan in that he's like sure like and so every time my brother and I mm. are talking they're like hey you want you want to we doing this on Saturday sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Anyway, okay. And then Karen uh, mentioned, Drew, I'm the person that you described who uses the Pilot Custom Heritage 92. I love this pen. I take nice. copious notes and write in my journal daily. I mentioned like there's that one, one person who probably has that as their primary pen. And Karen says that is her. I'm thinking of getting a Pilot 823, but I'm wondering what the difference is between the two. Is it worth adding the 823? Does the 823 provide a vastly different experience? Love Fridays because of the pencast. It's always fun listening to the antics of Brain and Drew. You got a brain in there, Brian. It happened. That's me. That's me. Big brain. Brain, brain goblet. Um, so, oh yeah, auto Or brain always. toilet, depending yeah. on <laughs> yeah, brain which, toilet which sometimes. Yeah, brain um, toilet sometimes. I don't want to get in too much to this, Karen, because the... Uh, you know, talking about the 823, we could go a long time with that. But no, it does not offer a vastly different writing experience. Different filling mechanism, slightly larger nib, but um, there are plenty of resources you can look it up. I, I honestly don't think you're going to find there to be a world of writing difference between the two. I'd between the A23 and the 92, is that what we're talking yeah. about? Or yeah. the 74 and the A23? Hey, either way. Oh, yeah, I, I guess it could, I could be... Yeah, there's three pens mentioned yeah. here. Personally, I think the... The 92 and the 74 are dang near identical. Because yeah. the size is the same, the weight's the same. The A23, I could argue, you know, the weight is a little bit different. Like, there's a little more heft to it. It's, so it's I could, distributed differently, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The nib is slightly larger. It feels mm -hmm. pretty similar. But, you know, that one I could maybe make an argument. But it's, it's, it's a, a chunk of change to... Um, get a pretty similar writing experience so oh yeah i mean the a23 costs it costs almost twice as much as a 74 so yeah. you, you you would expect more of a difference for the yeah. so to answer your question is there does it provide a vastly different experience no it does not, not vast no no not vast um and then we also had several pens because we mentioned something about noodlers smell and dogs at the end of the <laughs> at, i might have been in the turkey hammock zone so who knows what we were actually talking oh, about it was definitely but, in there yeah but deep in we the zone. had yeah we had quite a few people actually get their dogs to smell noodlers pens and uh shared the results with us on the youtube comments uh varying results brian some dogs uh liked it and chose to lick it and then some dogs uh <laughs> did not like it one bit so hmm, i, I would like say much like people. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Mm. Exactly. Man's best friend. Totally like us. Though it's I would just... say, to the credit of the dogs that liked the smell, if their smell is 100,000 100, times more sensitive than ours, you could argue they like it more because if they smell it that strong and still like it, <laughs> you know, more credit to them. Fair enough. So yeah, that, that's what I have. Did you find anything worth, worth note? Uh, well, one thing I while you were talking, I looked up smorgasbord. Duh, it Duh. ends in a D. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a type of Scandinavian meal originating originating in Sweden, served like buffet style. It's like a whole mess of different types of foods. So there you go, Swedish How about that? Swedish mess of food smorgasbord. Now we know. No one cared. Now we know. But now we know. Okay, Karis said, "What's the definition of serial hobbyist?" Um, I would say that it is somebody who is like all in, like deep in a hobby. You're like borderline obsessive about it. But you either, I think it could come in a couple of different flavors. You could either have a number of very deep interests. And I'm thinking like to the point where your family doesn't want to hear you talk about it anymore. That's got to be a, <laughs> one aspect of it, right? You 
belong to some type of private forum group club of some kind around Does it have to be private this thing not private i mean like you know place where only that thing is discussed gotcha. you know like an intentional group created for such thing um and uh when someone wants to buy you a gift for the thing they just ask you what you want because it's too much to explain what it is that you want and you just have to, you have to tell them this is the thing that i want i think you know i know just came up with all that off the top of my head but um so you could either be somebody who's like all in like that on one thing and then you give it up and go into something else and then something else and then something else so you talk to somebody and like hey, i haven't seen you in five years are you still really into you know kayaking on the ocean and you're like no i haven't done that in three years now i'm into pickleball and you're like what okay that's random you know you get people that just like skip and jump from one thing to the other yep. uh, or you get people who are like really deep on several different hobbies and they may have like different groups that they're like involved in you know like you could be really involved in like your volleyball team and then you also collect stamps and you fix antique typewriters and you're like super deep on all three of them so i don't know i'm more of the second group i have you know things i, I collect my hobbies basically i stay into all of them for long periods of time and revisit them and fall back in love with them i don't have many hobbies that i've gotten super into and then just abandon completely i don't know what about you drew you're a serial hobbyist I think that the fountain pen realm has its share of hobby collectors, people that mm. collect hobbies. And yes, I, I, I collect uh, coins, retro video games. I am a bit of a nerd VHS about, tapes now. 1984 yep. VHS tapes. VHS tapes from 1984. I'm almost done with my collection though, Brian. The shelf is getting full. Mm. So um, I think I have room for like one or two more. But then that then that's gonna be it. And uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a coffee nerd sometimes. I do like kayaking. I, there's always there's always something. But uh, these days, it's kind of expensive to be a collector of things because I think during the pandemic, everybody decided to start collecting things. So it's prices of everything skyrocket. If you're a collector of you know uh, video games or Pokemon cards or vinyl records, like all those prices are up through the roof now. So it's it's a little difficult, which is why I started VHS because nobody wants those. <laughs> They're still cheap and unwanted. Yay. Hey Drew, just for quick reference while you're talking, uh, IMDB says that there were 3,556 titles released in 1984. So I think you, I think you could keep going if you wanted to. You know? I know the the deal was to don't do don't do it. No, you know I have rails on my hobbies, Brian. Yeah, it's just that shelf. Fifty six. That's nope. the rails. Right it's there. the shelf. The shelf. I have physical <laughs> barriers to this hobby because otherwise I will go off the rails. That That's shelf smart. once complete smart. is done. I know um, myself. I know that I need limits. Uh, along the same lines, Caitlin said, "Brian, who's here that's not a serial hobbyist? Me. <gasps> In the middle of binding a book." Guiltily no, no, looking. She's, she's, she's saying that you said this and then she said that. Oh, she said what? I said, yeah, I said, who's here that's not a serial hobbyist? And then she's saying me, I think. No, I no, no, no. She's, she, it's her talking now. She's talking. What? I'm confused. It's in quotes and there's multiple people being addressed. So she's, she says, Brian says something. And then she's saying in third person, she's saying the me? second thing. Me? She's talking as me? No, no. She's talking as Caitlin. Yeah. That's what but I was she's, saying. She's not saying that she is the not serial hobbyist, though. Okay, I, I pose a question. Who's here that's not a serial hobbyist? And then she, as herself, is saying me. No, no. She's she's saying that she is a serial ho hobbyist. Okay, I'm confused, but I'm just going to read the words that she okay, said. Okay. In the middle of binding a book, guiltily looking back at her sta of her stack of unbuilt... Gundam model kits waiting for her golden monkey loose leaf tea to brew while her significant other is setting up the 3D resin printer. Well, dang. Okay, definitely a serial hobbyist. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. she's saying you said that and then she's like, me, meanwhile, doing this. Ah, so she was not thinking she was a serial hobbyist, but then coming no, to no, that she's, realization. No, she's no, she's saying that... <laughs> Why am I having such a hard time understanding this? <laughs> it's like, Brian, <clears throat> hey... I'm glad that no one is, you know, has too many beverage vessels. Me. Uh-oh, you know, gotcha. that sort okay. of thing. All right, all right. Wow. 
All right, I'm firing on all <laughs> cylinders today, folks. It's because I didn't gel my hair. I need that gel to No, like, no, 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 it's fine. You know, that would just weigh you down. the strength of my head. That would just know? weigh you down. <laughs> so um, he- probably heavy enough. There you go. All right, uh, another question for you guys. Have you ever attended a pen meetup in your local area? And if you haven't, would you ever consider hosting a meetup when safe, like going through an act like meetup? Well, that's... Uh, that's a thing. Uh, I have attended a local meetup before once. I don't know if you were there, Drew. I don't so think was you it were. Was one that think... Chet did? Yeah, Chet did. Well, Chet did a few of them. Chet Herbert, he lives mm-hmm. in our local area. He had hosted a few of them. I attended the first one. It was very difficult, though. I was like, had a lot of family obligations and stuff. I couldn't attend most of them, and I don't know if it's still going on. This was several years ago. I did it, but it was at a brewery, and I don't drink. So that was part of the, not a, I mean, i not opposed to drinking. I just generally don't. I don't like the taste of most drinks, but anyway, um, yeah, I've attended, but basically like it's hard for me to attend pretty much any social anything because of my time and family commitment obligations. So that pretty much did me in on the attending the meetup thing, but pen people are cool. Like I always love hanging out with pen people. So yeah. And we'll be host to the one though. Uh, that's tougher. That's tougher. We really can't host it easily at our office um and uh we could host it somewhere else i guess but the only thing that i'm worse at than showing up to something regularly is organizing and hosting something and then showing up at something regularly so is this is this i've never used an app like meetup would that is that just like saying like hey we're gonna be here and then that's it because you wouldn't really have to host much there just say hey show up here i guess i mean yeah but you still gotta like pick a place and have it there and you can't just like I don't know if you have like 30 people at a restaurant or a bar or something like that. I mean, if you guess you could just show up, but if you're going to be taken over the place on a random Tuesday, no, you just pick, they have like pick, pick a person. random, pick a random field. Oh yeah. Okay. Just some, some place in the wilderness. Yeah. Have like a G like a geo tagging <laughs> Pokemon go style. Like <laughs> meet me on the side of route seven. I don't know what that is. In the cow pasture. In the cow pasture across from <laughs> old McDonald's farm. And you'll see who's dedicated and shows up. Everybody. There's no lights. There's no lights anywhere, so bring a flashlight. I don't know. What are we talking about? Anyway. Would, would, would you, would say, like I said, would you ever consider hosting one? Uh, ever? Maybe. Like once my kids are out of the house. Because basically family time is sacred. So... Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but my don't get your hopes up. I like people. Pen people are cool. But yeah, I'm not a real host a lot of things kind of guy. No, but you do enjoy hanging out at a uh, after a pen show. I do love me some pen shows. Yeah. But I got to like move the earth to be able to make it to one of those. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. It's not it's not it's not due to lack of interest, though. Right. Oh, no, not at all. Due to lack of ability, (laughs) capability, (laughs) capacity. Yeah. Whatever. You get what I'm saying. All that stuff. All right. That's the feedback we got for this week. This is weird. This is going to be a weird pen cast, but that's all right because now we're going to get into some new stuff. What is new and coming soon this week? Drew, I got some things to talk about. Some well, sailor you should, you should, you should bespeak on that. I'm going to bespeak on my bespoke announcement. So um, I alluded to this at the intro. Um, and yeah, we are now officially a sailor bespoke dealer what what that's pretty dang exciting Um, what does that even mean brian that's a great question i'm so glad you asked um so basically um sailor has you know a number of different lines different offerings um and they have quite frankly limited availability on some of their more interesting and exciting products so they can't just have them go out through all retailers. So they have sort of, I don't know, call them levels, call them whatever, um, categories, classifications of, uh, you know, certain products and different retailers that you can get them through. So um, the bespoke is, I guess, a more, call it an exclusive um, group of retailers that carry some of the truly limited things that Sailor makes. So you're talking like maybe a, a couple hundred of something or less throughout the world you know these are mostly handmade things lots of you know yurushi lacquer stuff ebonite things 
Um, really interesting stuff that you just don't see every day, not only with Sailor, but with pretty much anybody. So um, they have been doing this for, I don't know, quite some time. And uh, some people know the bespoke because some bespoke dealers you can get specialty nibs through, like nib grinds and stuff like that. Believe it or not, the nib thing is actually kind of like a another level, <laughs> if you will. Um, they have such limited offerings on the nibs that uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're not gonna have like the King Eagle and other really kind of cool specialty nibs. This is just um, specialty pens, basically. So, you know, we've announced periodically that we've had like availability of the, the Ink Studio line. Like that's an exclusive ink line that's only available to, you know, certain, you know, certain dealers um, who carry Sailor that, you know, carry a certain range of products and represent them a certain way. Um, and then Sailor will, you know, essentially kind of pick who who carries, you know, this more exclusive line of things. Um, Bespoke is, is kind of like that. Um, the Naganata Togi nib, that was a specialty nib, specialty pen. That was kind of another thing that they couldn't make available through everybody because of its limited nature. So we've, we've thankfully been able to be on good graces and really represent the brand well. Y'all have received it really well. And um, it's really worked out where, you know, they felt that we've represented it in such a way that we could, you know, consider this bespoke line, which, you know, we've aspired to be able to offer some of these things for quite some time. There's no strict application process or anything. So we basically have to kind of be patient and wait and just see if the availability was ever possible. And, you know, it became possible and we were like, okay, let's definitely do that. So, um, you know, we're really excited about it. Most of the bespoke retailers that they've had in the past have been brick and mortar centric stores. You know, sometimes they've been online, but they've usually had a brick and mortar presence. Um, they, you know, cause some of these things they're, they don't have a lot of them. They're really not trying to like overhype, over promote. It's really meant to be for the collectors, the hardcore sailor enthusiasts. So it, because it's such a limited nature, they haven't gone super wide and promoting these things very heavily. So I guess we, I could, I could see where we to them would be a little bit more speculative as an online only focused retailer. Um, but I think because of how we represent stuff and the photography that we do, the videos that we do, they felt that um, we could represent it well. So it is something that we are learning more about their line. Um, and we have you know, a couple different pens to talk about today that are new, that are with the bespoke line. Um, and so I'll talk about them, but I will say they are just extremely limited in nature. So if you're watching this video six months from now, we probably are not going to have any of these pens left because they are going to be so limited. So it's we're going to have to learn how to navigate that and not uh, box ourselves in with with hyping something up that is you know going to be gone in a minute because that does happen sometimes. Um, but anyway, I'll at least uh, cover a couple of the pens just to give you some examples of at least what we're currently seeing with this uh, bespoke line. So the first one that we have is called the Rei Yururi, uh, sorry, Rei Yurushi Nuri. And I will say I will botch a lot of these pronunciations, but I will try my best. So these are 1911L bodies. So these are the mid-size 1911s, bigger than the 1911S, smaller than the King of Pens. So they have nice mid-size with the, the um, you know, 21 karat nibs. So these are um, using a Yurushi lacquering technique that mimics a pe paper making technique called Suminagashi, okay? So these are um, in that limited edition pricing range. So it's $1,395, that's $1,395 for these pens. And the pen bodies themselves are made out of ebony wood and they have that Yurushi lacquer technique on top of the wood. And then I believe the grip itself is actually a PMMA resin. So the grip itself is not wood, which I'm glad to see because wood plus ink, generally not a great thing, but grips are resin, so that's good. Um, they have three different colors and these things, I mean, they just look unbelievable. Um, so Aomori Ryuman Nuri. So this is red, green, and yellow, and it's meant to look kind of marbly. Um, and it's made by the ar artist Hirozaku Shimamori. Okay, so that's one of the colors. Looks really cool. Uh, the next one is Ishikawa Kaganuri. And this is using the Naguru Nuri technique. And you may have seen pens like this before. I've seen other brands of pens that have this Yurushi technique. It's the black lacquer undercoating with the vermilion over top. So it's got like a black and red kind of a vibe. Very, you know, 
very cool, very Sith Lord kind of looking. If there was a Yurushi Sith Lord pen, this might be it. Um, so this is uh, done by Isana Kobayashi. And then the third color that they have is the Iwate Kin Kinashuri Nuri. And this is a teal and black lacquer that looks really, really cool. Very dark teal color uh, done by Natsumi Saitu. So these are really, really unique looking pens. We've never really carried anything that look quite like these. And we are not going to have many of them. I will say that. I mean, I'm talking like single digits. So if you are interested in any of the Sailor Bespoke pens, you know, kind of save up in advance for them and then pounce once they become available because they will not be available very much. The other pen that we have looks freaking just awesome. Um, this is called Ryoko, and this is a 1911 uh, King of Pens that is a teal ebonite pen. So it's like a teal and black kind of a swirl ebonite. Looks really cool. So this is a numbered, individually numbered, limited edition pen, 400 of them worldwide. Again, only through the bespoke dealers. Um, and it has, even though it's a 1911, which normally has that round top, this has an inlaid anchor in the top finial. So like a gold inlaid anchor, like you might. So it's not quite a flat top like you would have on the Pro Gear, but it's, you know, it's kind of in between there. It's not not perfectly round on top. So it looks, looks really cool. And the trim is uh, really cool. It looks really good with the teal color. And it's got a really cool nib. So it's got that Naganata Togi nib, which we have a full video if you want to see what that nib is all about. Basically, it varies in width depending on the angle that you're holding the pen. Sort of like a zoom nib, if you're familiar with that at all, but slightly different. Um, we have that in medium, fine, and medium. And it's got the big 21 karat bicolor nib, which just looks so good. That Sailor King of Pens bicolor nib. Mm. Definitely works for me. Um, this is a $1,900 pen. And just like the other ones, the uh, Rei Yurushi Nuri's, this is pretty much a one-shot deal. We're gonna have a very small handful of these pens and then they're gonna be gone. So I would get on it and uh, go check it out if you're interested. But either way, just go look at them because they look pretty amazing. So we are very honored to be starting out with these bespokes and uh, you know, we don't really get a ton of advance notice of what they're gonna be coming out with in the bespoke collection. So it is kind of difficult to, you know, say in advance what's happening and give you all notice, but that's something that we're going to be feeling out as we get into the bespoke line more and more. So if y'all have ideas about you know, how we can best communicate that to you. Again, we're in this weird spot because we're not gonna have a lot of the pens, so we don't wanna just blast it out to the masses every time we get one of these in, but we wanna be able to get that information to you if you want it. So, I don't know, we're gonna brainstorm that, but uh, that's a thing now. That's a thing that we get to do. So, super excited about that. Whew. Yeah, and, it's a new fun yeah. adventure. We're Very figuring exciting. it out as we go along. Yeah. Also from Sailor, Brian, on as a, kind of spiritual successor for their, actually a legitimate successor, no spiritual about it, mm. a sequel to the Sailor Cocktail set that they came out with. Well, the set came out last year, but the pens had been released for many years prior to that. Mm -hmm. They have released an entire set of a new cocktail series, not sold individually, um, not officially anyway. And that cocktail set is going to feature four new pens, Violet Fizz, Blue Train, Argentina, and Gin Martini. They're all being sold together for $1,560. So they are very limited, quite expensive, but you do get four pens. And um, mm. as far as we know, uh, they are not planning on releasing them individually. We have not been told yeah. about that. So as far as we know, this is the way to get them. Mm -hmm. So we do have some of those in stock. They yeah. are... Uh, I, w I will say we have ha we have seen some other retailers that have chosen to bro break them up, break up the sets themselves. We've thought about it, talked about it. It's possibly an option, but it is difficult because it's it's all packaged together as one set. So if you break it up, it's like you're really breaking up an individual kind of a thing. So we didn't quite want to do that right off the bat, but we'd love your feedback on that. If you all are interested in just particular pens, if the whole set is too much, let us know. Um, you know, we kind of told Sailor, we were like, hey, you know, there's a lot. It's an investment to buy this many pens at once. So we'll see 
how it goes. Um, but you know, we're kind of in an information gathering mode with some of this, which is really cool. It's always cool when we can work with a manufacturer to be like, hey, let's let's see what the community wants, and we'll tell you all. And do they even come know, with adapt. individual boxes? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't We're know. gonna figure that I out. I have one waiting for me there at the office, but I haven't been yeah. yet to pick it up. We'll, so. we'll take a look. We'll take we'll a look. You know. um, also on our radar, this isn't coming right now, but in March at some point, there is going to be a new Caveco Sport, and that is going to be coming in iridescent pearl. And this pen has been super popular on the social medias, Brian. Yeah, it in fact, looks... we should probably stop talking about it because it's already got yeah. a lot of hype and we're gonna sell out of them immediately it looks so. unlike any caveco that has come out it's not a solid color it literally is iridescent it's very pearlescent and uh, the name serves it well so it's a very attractive pen coming in march at some point but it is on the product page if you want to sign up for our email alerts we will let you know as soon as it is in stock so yes that's how you do it yeah, we still got to work through the logistics on that. We're toying with the idea of doing a timed launch or something. That That's always tough for us to know whether we should do that because it is a lot of extra coordination to make that happen. But with really high demand things, you know, it's worth that effort. So the jury's out yet on whether we're going to do that or not, but it could be possible that we could. But either way, just check out the product page, sign up for that email list, and then you'll know more information when Always a good idea. Relevant. Yeah. Cool. All right, lots of new stuff, and there's other things that we haven't even talked about, but you can definitely go check out the new arrivals and coming soon stuff on GooliePens.com if you're ever curious about new things that are happening. All right, now we're going to get into our Q&A for the week. All right, I'm going to kick off with the first question this week from you, our audience listener folk. This question comes from John. After shimmering ink has dried on the paper, can some of the shimmer particles become dislodged by normal shuffling of the paper, Drew? Well, John, that depends on what kind of shuffling you're doing. But yeah, basically, yes. The answer is yes. Um, yeah. So it you've got your dye, and that is not water. Water absorbs into the paper, right? We all know that. Mm -hmm. Dye is really, really tiny, tiny, tiny particles that might as well be attached to the water for you know for the sake of this question the shimmer particles however are not that small and if you're treating the paper as like a filter right and water and dye cannot can kind of make it through the filter but these shimmer particles cannot they're gonna lay on top i mean i guess if you've got a very very absorbent paper with really loose you know fibers sure i guess some particles kind of could find their way in there but more often than not those shimmer particles are going to sit on top while the rest absorbs down into the paper and um yeah it'll stay for the most part depending on the type of paper you have but if it if it does encounter some friction normally like if you've got a journal and you've got some shimmer uh in there normal flipping of the pages probably won't dislodge it a lot but if you've got like several loose sheets and you know you're going in and out uh that would have a more severe effect because at that point you've got like you're it's rubbing it's not just laying you know like journal pages would so it really depends on your definition of shuffle <laughs> i guess but if you it more or less if you if it does encounter friction, yes, it will dislodge and come off on pages or your fingers or whatever is shuffling up against it. Right, Brian? Yeah, more or less. I yeah. didn't hear some of that because my daughter just got home and I realized the door was cracked and I heard her and I was like, oh gosh, I guess I'll ah, no, I didn't hear. So that's why I escaped there for a minute. Um, yeah, I would say that, uh, sorry, forgive me if I duplicate anything that you said. I was mm. not intending not to listen to you. Oh, that's okay. I was just literally- I said everything perfectly. Um, I think they said the type of paper can have some impact on this. Uh, the more absorbent the paper is, the less likely you are to have some of the particulate come off. Did you already say that? Or is that why you're smiling? In, in, in a way. Okay, so if you have like a Tomoe River or a Clairefontaine tree on something like that, you're going to get more shimmer that could possibly come off. I don't know if it happens as much. I don't know what your feeling is, Drew. Just like shuffling paper is like paper rubbing on paper. 
I think when I'm like rubbing my finger across it, like if I'm actually touching it with my hand, oh, it picks yeah, it up definitely. more. Oh, so absolutely. I don't, know that, I don't know if it's just shuffling paper, but I think it's more like your finger, the hand oils, that kind of well, thing. Yeah, that would definitely do it. But yeah. if, 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 over the peri- if over a period of time, if you have used shimmer ink in a paper that just gets a lot of movement, then mm-hmm. it's, it's possible for sure. Now, have you noticed, Drew, because I mean, we talked a little bit about, this isn't specifically this question, but it's kind of related to it. Um, I'm thinking about some of the, you know, Urban inks and stuff that have like a really fine shimmer as opposed mm-hmm. to some of the chunkier ones, mm-hmm. you know, like some of the Diamine Shimmer Tastics and all that, Robert Oster's. Do you see a difference in how easily some of those shimmers rub off? Like, do you think it's a matter of the size of the shimmer or is it just the amount of shimmer maybe that's in there? Yeah, I think it's the amount. Both? I think I think that um, this is just totally out of my silly brain, but I think that when you've got shimmer just on the paper, like just sprinkled in here or there, it seems to adhere better to the paper than when shimmer is on other shimmer, if that makes any sense at all. Because paper is just more grabby. The fibrous nature of it at a, you know, a very, very detailed level you know, is a little bit more textured. And, you know, you can probably get a layer of shimmer on there that's going to adhere and kind of like find its way into some of those nooks and crannies from a, not microscopic level, I guess, but a pretty, pretty detailed level. And then if you've got too much shimmer though, it's just gonna lay on top of more shimmer and it's got no place to stick. But Mm. I don't know, that's just my brains. But I do feel like if you've got paper like this and you've kind of like got shifting happening and your paper's doing that then yeah it's basically like something's rubbing up against it and it's going to come off but if you're gentle with it and it's just a normal notebook opening closing you should be fine i don't know if it comes off in terms of like you can't see the shimmer on your writing anymore i think it's more just that you know like any type of glitter it'll relocate yeah you'll end up with things being slightly glittery that you didn't specifically put glitter there yep i personally have never used a shimmer ink where after handling it for a while i'm like I thought this used to be shimmery. There's no shimmer left. You still see the shimmer that's on the paper, but I think just like Drew said, if you have shimmer on top of shimmer, like the excess shimmer could yeah. rub off. You'll still, your writing will still be shimmery. You just might have some other things that are shimmery, like your fingers or your doorknob or your dog. I'm just kidding. It's usually that's not right. that bad. Some inks will do that though. Sheening inks too. Sheen, I think that have a lot of sheen, they tend to also um, dislodge a little bit. But yeah, I was looking up Drew as you were talking because I was questioning my own understanding of dye versus pigment because I always th- I always thought like dye was you know pretty much like liquid and pigment was solid. You know, I think about like pigments in ink and or sorry in paint, you know, versus like dye in like clothes or food coloring or something like that. But I was so I was just kind of like double checking myself looking it mm-hmm. up as you were talking. But they are both particulates. Like they Yeah, are... I just I always assumed that dye was like like Ultra, it's ultra, really, ultra really fine. fine. Yeah, so it's yeah, like yeah. some of the things I'm reading online, uh, which if it's on the internet, it must be true. Uh, but basically that the, it's a, it's a matter of a size difference. So dyes are essentially, you know, pigmentation that is so small that it's soluble in water. So it will actually dissolve in the water and stay in suspension. Whereas pigments are larger. It's like the size comparison between a pinhead and like a basketball. You know, the pigment would be the basketball and the dye would be the It's a pretty big pinhead. difference. Yeah, it's a big difference. So the, the dye itself will stay suspended just in the water or ink in this case. So it, it's, you, you really don't get this kind of like transfer like what we're talking about just with typical dye. But if you have a pigment, then it could. And a pigment will not stay in suspension unless it has some kind of binder. Um, so, you know, if you have latex paint, there's binders and stuff that allow that paint color to remain consistent and everything doesn't just settle down to the bottom, even though it will over time eventually anyway. Um, when you have ink, obviously the shimmer will settle down, um, but maybe not quite as much because um, there's usually a some kind of a binder salt, I believe, can be one of the things that helps to keep um, certain pigments in suspension. But I think when you're talking shimmer enough to actually look glittery on the page, you're talking like, you know, really, really large, like beach ball sized, you know, pieces of, particulate as opposed to the pin head that would be the water soluble stuff in dye. Anyway, I was not like a chemistry whiz. So it's just, it's confusing. And with this ink stuff, it's a little bit like 
mythical magical in terms of you know it's a little bit of ink alchemy because we never really get like super specific details about how any of these inks are created so we're sort no. of just left to our own devices to understand it so oftentimes we don't understand it any better than you do um but uh probably shouldn't say that but it is the reality that happens <laughs> on this pencast we may not know what we're talking about but we'll always be straight with you anyway. absolutely all right. All right. Next one. Speaking uh, of things Brian, we don't know much about. Well, yeah, Brian <laughs> might be diving a little deep on this one, folks. We've got a twofer. So two yeah. people wrote in. It's not a deep, um, it's not too deep of a dive, hopefully. It's a full page of thinking, it's, it's, Brian. Mm, okay, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. Okay. okay. Um, you might surprise me and truncate yourself, but we will see. I'll leave room to be surprised. Okay. All Here right. So our next one comes from Eva Buck X. And Eva says, Fude nibs, what are some fun things to use them for? Is it a must have slash must try? And then in addition to that, mm. Word Boy One also asks, what is the use of reverse writing? And these two questions mm. have some similarities. So we're gonna address them both, or should I say, Brian is going to address them both. Yeah, thanks for throwing me in the deep end on these. I thought you'd Drew. have fun with this one. Yeah. This way uh, I can give you a, I can give you a question that I know you'll go deep on and then I can admonish you for going you know, go on a deep dive. Like, geez, like Brian, why'd you do that? Yeah. I yeah. know what I was doing. Not I'm only one, you but you piled two questions I in there, knew what I was you, doing. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. It's all good. Yeah, enjoy. That's right. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe I'll start singing and then just make you cringe in pain. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's not fair. That's not fair, Brian. <laughs> all right. All right. Food a nibs. So it's, it's typed out F-U-D-E. If you look at it online, it looks like feud, but it's food a uh honestly i have very limited experience meaning no experience actually writing with a fude nib but i understand You've never written with one how i've never written with a fude nib really yeah oh yeah when i said that you were throwing me in i really meant i it. didn't I know that know. yeah i've never actually used one of these particular nibs but i understand how they work and i've gotcha. talked to people and seen you know so I, I feel like i know enough to be dangerous so full disclaimer I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm well, we've kidding. got one. We've got one here. Actually, I'll give it to you next time you come. Really? We have one at the office? Yeah, we have a Jin Hao. Oh, my gosh. How have I never seen this thing? I don't know. I'm surprised. No, I'm doubting. Have I ever seen it? No, I would have known if I'd written with that thing. I remember everything. Yeah. It's no. a 159. Okay. I, or, well. I ordered I ordered it off Amazon just to kind of see what it was, see, see what the deal was. Okay. Well, then you will get to pipe in with your own experience on it. So uh, my understanding is that the Fude nibs is basically a nib. Think of like a stub nib that's bent. That's kind of, so it's a, it's a nib that looks like it was dropped and it's like flat and kind of sticking out. So it has regular nib right up against the feet and then like, very stark, very intentional. Well, bent, bent downwards because if it's bent the other way, it's something different. Oh, see, now you're making me think I don't, no, wait, what? Hang on. Yeah, Fude is down, Fude is down, Waverly is up. I may be completely mistaken about what this thing even is. Okay, this shows this shows I really don't know what I'm talking about. Food day. Let me look it up. <laughs> bent down. Okay, where where's the picture of this thing? Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's bent. It it flares up. It flares away from the feed, like it's bent that way. You need to look uh, it up, Drew. Food day goes up. Yeah, I thought Waverly went up. Waverly does, but Food day is more stark than that. Waverly oh my is like, gosh! Waverly so what's down very, then? Oh my god, now yeah, I'm an idiot. See? Oh, oh no. Drew. Oh see, no. You thought, you thought you were throwing me in the deep end here and you're Well we do have one. I guess yeah. I haven't looked at it in a while. Drew either. got carried out by the riptide and he's like <laughs> out in the middle of the ocean, lost. Oh man. Yeah, a fude, it looks it's it's the Waverly is like just a gentle bend out. Oh my god. A fude is right. like, like a flat. Oh man, like, I was so wrong. I apologize, Brian. Yeah, you really threw me in here. Is yeah, that what you, we have? Is that what we have in the office? We, gosh, we really shouldn't. I don't know. Be more I need to look at it. This. I don't trust you anymore, Drew. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> I don't trust myself. <clears throat> I believe that that if you or if we got, if you got one of the Jin Hao ones, then it should look like this. Yeah. Um, anyway, so basically, it's a nib that's like looks like it was just bent, you know, up. Uh, so my understanding is that the purpose of the Fude nib is to be able to do like a much broader stroke. You know, it, not just like a stub nib where you're trying to do like a, a broad downstroke, you're trying to almost do like more of like a paintbrush type stroke. So it's something that uh, is not at all popular uh, with Western writing because there's not really a practical use for it with any type of 
Western script. Um, uh, so it comes from Asia uh, and uh, is used more where like character writing would be uh, something that you would practically use this pen for. Um, I, the people that I know that use them, use them for art, for drawing, you know, doing urban sketching and these types of things. But even then, it's not super popular. I don't know if it's because of the availability or just it's got such a kind of a limited use. So for me, going back to the original wording of the question, is it a must have or must try? I would say it is not a must anything because it's such a niche kind of obscure nib. And clearly because Drew and I are in the business and we don't even know what it is clearly, but <laughs> Um, you knew you, know. you knew more than I did. I was I was delusional. Well, but you you, you also write with it upside down, right? You can, I guess. Like, like, I like you, you, the, the the if you write with it normally, it gives you that thick line, but then you flip yeah, yeah, it yeah. over and you it gives you the it thin over line. And, and, yeah. But then it's like just a kind of a normal nib, right? But so. I think that's that's the point of it, though. Isn't aren't fudes always ground to do both? I that I don't know. Dang that it! I don't know. So right. it's possible. We need we it's need to possible. learn more about fude nibs, Brian. I mean, clearly we mm. don't know enough, but this is a yeah. thing is like, we've had people ask about it here and there. Nobody really knows what's going on. It's not something really offered from basically any of the brands that we carry. Not in America. So, like, yeah, we don't yeah. get distributed those sorts of nibs in the U S yeah. There's just very little interest in, in all that kind of stuff. Not, not to say that it, there couldn't be some use for it, but it's a very, very much of a specialty kind of but thing. But even if we, even if we wanted it, the, you know, brands that probably carry it in Japan, like pilot don't import it to the U S so we couldn't even yeah. sell them if we wanted to. Yeah. So, I mean, the one thing, the one thing, you know, that Drew mentioned is that we've got it, you know, ordered a Jinhao one, you know, just through our whatever, through Amazon or whatever. Um, we did look into it because there was, I don't know, three or four years ago, there was some chatter about like, oh, Jinhao has it. And we looked into it, but the minimums required for us to buy it were really high, like way higher than we thought there would actually be demand for. So, and then I think we got it, and we were like, "How the heck do you use this thing? Like, what?" I even, remember I, th I bought two. What and even one is of them, <laughs> One of them worked really well. One of them didn't work at all. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, especially with Jinhao, it's like we're we're like on our own, you know, kind of dealing with that. They don't have as much of a you know support structure on the retail side as like a sailor or a pilot or something like that. So we did not feel confident enough, clearly, as we still don't, in understanding what it is or how to write with it or how to troubleshoot it or how to teach anybody about it or how what it is or what even exists in the world um so yeah our lack of confidence translated into let's just keep our mouth shut about it so thank you drew so much for bringing this I love, to light. I love at the beginning of this question <laughs> didn't we say that we'll always be honest when we don't know what we're talking about that was why it was such a good segue that was before um, we <laughs> yeah so we had no idea being completely honest i have no idea if a food nib has anything to do with writing upside down but we can still I'm, talk about that i i added this question because i thought that Fude nibs were intended to do both. We're gonna get roasted it's in the comments. Possible? We're gonna be, so so many people are gonna know what they're talking about, and we don't. It's um, possible. I've heard of a condor nib, Drew. That's that's the one that been. hooks down. That yeah. hooks down, but that's yeah. not that's not a flat blunt kind no. of a thing. That's like a no. really that also looks like a bent nib, but bent yeah much much down. I know that some people flip that over to write more like you would with the fude. I don't know. There's all this specialty yeah. stuff. It gets pretty obscure, but um. The challenge is with some of these like specialty nibs, there's no like body, like international body that dictates what something should be called or how a nib should be ground or whatever. So it's pretty much when you get into these like more obscure nibs, it's pretty much like individual nib meisters or companies that come up with these grinds and sometimes they're called one thing and they get called different things. And so it gets, it gets very obscure, um, which is part of the fun because you get to like dive in and kind of figure it out. But we clearly don't. No, enough. We only know enough to be dangerous. Um, but talking about reverse writing, which you could do with a food a nib or, yeah. <clears throat> you know, any nib basically. So, um, or, you know, reverse writing or call it upside down. You know, you're flipping a pen, fountain pen upside down so that the feed is facing towards the sky and the nib itself is pointed downwards. Now you can do this with any pen, technically. The thing I will say is that not everybody grounds their nibs to be written in such a way. So most of the time, you know, when you make a nib, you're, you know, welding the tipping onto the nib, assuming it's a tip nib, which most are, and they're smoothing, grinding all that so that it, you know, writes smooth and performs well in the most practical ways that people will hold it. Not every, you know, company or nibmeister or whatever will actually flip the nib all the way over and grind it smooth on the 
the flip side as well. So it's very possible that it could write acceptably, you know, maybe a little bit toothy or scratchy. Usually it's not gonna like not work at all because the nib has been aligned on the underside, the correct side. So usually, unless something crazy is going on, you're gonna be able to write with just about any pen upside down. It's just how pleasurable of an experience is it going to be? Um, but why would you even do this anyway? I think it's because usually when you're writing with something upside down, it's because you're going to get a little bit thinner line. And I think often it's because, you know, probably partly because when you're, when you have a ball of tipping on the end of a nib and then you're smoothing, you're grinding, you're doing all that kind of stuff, essentially you're broadening the nib just a little bit, the tip as you're doing that smoothing. And if you're not doing that stuff on the other side, it's going to be a little bit finer. So I think that's usually what ends up happening is when somebody is in a situation where they need to write something, th a thinner line, you know, usually I think it's because you're having to write on some kind of paper that's like really absorbent, that's not paper that you control. You know, one example that comes to mind is we had somebody that said that, you know, when we talked about this in the past, um, you know, they gave an example of they, they work for like a government or, or, you know, some governmental body or whatever, and they have to do physical like sign-ins, you know, for inspections and stuff like that on, on, a, on a sheet that's hanging there. Well, they don't control what paper that is. You know, they get to write on whatever they want for their own personal stuff, but then they have to sign in and check on their whatever inspections. And that paper that they use there is really absorbent. So they said that they'll write normally with their pen, but then, you know, they like broad nibs and these kinds of things. But when they have to write in these like sign in inspection forms, you get like one little box. It's this really absorbent paper. And if they wrote with their broad nib on that, it would just be unreadable. And somebody else has to be able to read it because they have to you know, check in on the inspections and stuff. So they will flip their nib over when they're writing their little inspection time and stuff so that it doesn't put down as much ink. That's and really then, cool. Yeah, so that was like the most practical use I've ever heard of flipping a nib over like that. But I would say in general, if you're like, oh, I'll just get a broad nib and then it'll write like a fine and I'll just write with it, you know, upside down a lot of the time. I don't think that's the motivation. That's not the that's not the approach that I would take towards reverse writing. I would plan on doing it more as an exception. Um, sort of like if you're buying a nib, I think of a similar scenario where you have a, a nib like the Pilot E95S that you hear is kind of springy. You can get a little line variation out of it. I wouldn't call it a flex nib, but I would say if you want to like do a signature every now and then that's got some line variation, okay, yeah, sure, you can use it for that. You know, it's a little bit softer nib but you're not gonna do all your writing with that. Then what you really want is a, is a flex nib or a stub or something like that. It can do it every now and then, but it's not meant to be done all the time like that. I think when you're thinking about reverse writing with a nib, if, especially if you like broader nibs, if you're using fines, extra fines, things like that, reverse writing will gain you nothing. It'll probably just feel awful on the page and skip a lot. But if you have broader nibs and you every now and then come across paper that's just not able to take the ink that you're putting down, Try flipping it over and doing reverse writing and it could get you out of a bind, but don't put a lot of pressure down when you're doing it. Because when you think about it, when you flip your nib over, you've got the feed on top of the nib at that point. And as you're writing with any kind of a pressure, that feed is not going anywhere. So your tendency to be able to bend the nib is gonna be greater if you're reverse writing than it is if you flip it the other way around. So normally you, when you're writing, your feet is on the underside. And if you're bending the nib at all with extra writing pressure, the nib can move away from the feed and it can spring back. Well, if you flip it over, it has nowhere to go. So your likelihood of bending it and turning it into a modified condor slash food a unintentionally could be really high if you're really mashing down a, uh, a pen in reverse writing. So just be really conscious that that's what you're doing. And then last thing, Okay, this has ended up being a little bit of a deep dive, just to like a not not in the diving end of the pool, but like you know we're up to the up to the don't rope don't 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 deep dive, dive into your definition of a deep dive. <laughs> but um, I will say that I've seen um, specific nibmeisters like Richard Bender comes to mind. Um, I don't remember the name of this this grind, but he did a grind that was specifically done in such a way using like a broad or a double broad that was ground almost like a triangle where it was like really broad on one side and then it was ground specifically to be a fine nib or to be something on reverse writing. So there are nib meisters. I've never seen a company offer that, but I've seen nib meisters that will do this modification where they will specifically do a grind if you like to write with regularity with a nib that's reversed like that. 
know that that's an option that you could maybe do in the uh, in the aftermarket. Now I'm I was I, I've all I've tested a number of my pens for reverse writability, mm -hmm. and I've discovered some ones that write really really well reverse, and I don't remember any of them. So I'm always <laughs> like I'm like oh what was that one that wrote really good upside down? I don't hmm. know, no yeah. idea. Every, every now and then I just I just try and think I'm going to remember it, and I don't. Yeah, surprise, I just, surprise. I, I very rarely do it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a thing that most people do with any any regularity. But it could be, you know, like the inspection sheet thing. It could be something that uh, is useful to you. I just opt. I'm just like, let me just ink up another pen, and I'll just carry twenty pens with me. Sometimes I think it's handy because I only keep three pens inked up. So if I'm journaling mm. and I want there to be some sort of a thematic difference, normally I'll have a broad nib for my header, something with a brighter color, and then. For the rest, I'll have something different. But if I don't have that option avail available to me and I yeah, want okay. a header to be a little thicker and I want hmm. the other writing to be a little thinner just to differentiate it and give me a little okay. bit more of, of a, you know, kind of um, template variety, I guess, or, yeah. you know, format uh, variants, you can do that. If yeah, I could, if it works. A really, lot of times the upside down is scratchy and just disgusting, but yeah. sometimes you get lucky. I could see that working for like bullet journaling or something where you're like combo writing, draw, drawing, writing a lot. Or if you're doing sketching with a lot of like stippling or something like that, you know, if you have one that performs well upside down, you could get like finer dots or upside down. I don't know. Yeah. And outlines so, too. If you have, you know, if you a, a B Roman numeral outline structure with, you know, yeah. dots or bullets or whatever, you, yeah. you need to make, you know, your sub bullets a little bit smaller just to kind of differentiate. You can do that. Yeah. But I wouldn't buy a pen with like, oh, I'm just going to buy a broad and then just plan to write with it upside down all the time. Eh. No. I don't know anybody who's really generally been. But if you're at a pen show outcome. and you want to ask for that capability, you could also do that if you oh, have yeah. access to a nib grinder. Yeah, if you could get a cuffs and ground in such a way to be done that way, go nuts. All right, uh, Leafkin Way has a question. How do I clear sediment from a nib? I have a pen I flushed many times, but it still has flow issues. Mm. All right, well, mm. Leaf Kenway, I believe is your Leaf, name. what did I say? Life, Leaf? Le Leafkin Way. Leaf, Leaf, Ken Leaf Kenway, okay. Let's go with that. Cool. Um, okay, so if repeated flushing doesn't work, I'm assuming you've tried something other than water, like pen flush, uh, you'll probably need to disassemble. That's when you take your nib and your feed out and clean them individually and then put them back in. Um, if you've never disassembled your nib and feed before, check online for resources depending on which pen you have. If you've got a pen like a Custom 823, removing the nib and feed from that will void your warranty. And you could essentially be... Um, really limiting your post-sale support options. And we would not want to recommend that for you, especially if you're having a hard time, you might want to uh, figure that out first. So it really depends heavily on your pen. Like if you've got a Pilot Metropolitan, those can, you can remove the nib and feed on that super easily. And then 823, like I said, very, very, very different. So there's not gonna be one answer that's going to apply to all of these scenarios. Um, but we do have a bunch of videos focused on cleaning pens. So I will include those either up top here or down below in the description. So check those out if you are curious about those or you can just search cleaning on our channel and a bunch will come up. Um, so most nibs and feeds can be pulled out. They're friction fit nibs. You can just grub them with your thumb and forefinger as far back as possible away from the nib and just yank them out safely at a very straight distance. You don't wanna kind of like hold them here and pull them out like that because mm. then you could you know, end up snapping the post off of your back of your feet. You always want to pull them straight out, yeah. no angles. Um, and uh, once that's disassembled, then you can just give them a good cleaning. It doesn't take a whole lot else. Even a nib that's been sitting with junk in it for years, really some, some warm water and some pen flush and, uh, you know, a paper towel or a cotton swab can generally get everything done. For the feed, however, a toothbrush is the way to go. Maybe a uh, hey, Drew Lay uh, pen cleaning I, toothbrush. I'm saying an official Drew Lay pen company plain cleaning <laughs> toothbrush that doesn't exist might be just what you need. <laughs> Not to be confused with old toothbrush you already might have laying around. It's the it's if it's a, if it you can pretend it's a Drew Lay toothbrush. It'll it'll work better <laughs> if you do, guaranteed. Fair, um, enough, fair enough. So yeah, um, <clears throat> once that's done, give it a good scrub and get in the nooks and the crannies of that feed mm. and dislodge any ink. You could also soak it for a little while, you know, in just some warm water with a little bit of pin flush, that works too. 
and uh, yeah. if you want to, you can always, especially if it's a, actually, you know what, only if it's a pen we sell at the Goulet Pen Company, you can shoot an email to us over at our customer care department at info at um, We're always happy to help you clean your pens and figure out how to maintain them. Um, but remind you that very clearly, as it evidenced from our last conversation, our knowledge is very limited to what we sell and what we have sold in the uh, in the store. So we have I mean, a lot of it, but it, but it has... Be- well, I'll it be has honest walls. with you about where the boundaries are of what we know. Yes, yes. But yeah, we can never have a hundred percent confidence if we have no experience with said yes. pen before. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, really, where we run into issues is where we are not pen restorers or like vintage or antique pen like repair experts. So when you get into like old bladder filling mechanisms and stuff like that, it's like uh, there could be things disassembling that it's like. There could be shellac that is holding parts together. And a lot of new variables get introduced. Yeah, so I would say you have to use your judgment. If it's a really old pen, like decades old, there may be some other things to consider and then you would want to consult, especially if it's a pen that you just like picked up at a whatever flea market and you don't really care and you just want to try it, go nuts. But if it's something that's like handed down through your family and it's can never be replaced kind of a thing, I would reach out to somebody that does some actual pen restoration and consult with them before you go just ripping your pen apart because you know these days there aren't too many pens that you're going to cause a lot of problems with disassembling and usually when they don't want you to do that they'll they'll say not to do certain things um but when you get into some older pens there's some specific techniques you know there used to be a lot more pen repair people i'm talking like 50s 1940s 50s 60s that kind of thing there used to be like trained pen repair professionals around the the U.S. and around the world. Um, These days, mm, they're very few and far between. So, uh, you know, there used to be a lot more parts available. There used to be a lot more people that kind of knew how to do these things. Nowadays, eh, it's a little more specialized. So, you know, kind of use your own discretion there. Um, But yeah, I would say like the soaking thing. For like for me personally, if it's like dried ink that's in the pen, as a person who has historically waited way too long to clean certain pens, you know, I will try to take pens apart, but it usually benefits to do a little bit of soaking first because, you know, some of the sediment, which could be a number of different things, but usually it's dried up old crusty ink in there. If you let it soak, if you can actually get liquid in there, like water, pen flush, whatever it may be, if you can get it in there and it can, it just it making contact with that old dried ink will help to break it down and will make disassembly easier. It will be less likely that you'll damage parts and stuff like that. If you have, you know, some of these fins on some of these feeds and stuff like that can be, you know, bent or broken kind of easily. If you have old dried up ink in there, it almost kind of acts like glue and it can make it where you're more likely to damage your pen. So I would just say, try that, maybe try the soaking thing if you know that it's a dried up ink issue, not just a flow issue, but, um, you know, that could be holding your parts together and, and cause your risk of damage higher if you just go tearing into the thing. Uh, also, ultrasonic cleaner. I'm not sure if you mentioned that. That's another possibility. No, because he, he really was just saying, like, you know, uh, how do I clear it off? He never really... Um, yeah, he says he flushed it many times, but it has yeah, flow issues. I think that so, yeah, it's, you're going to need to disassemble it and clean it. Probably. Yeah. More than likely. But yeah. if you can't disassemble it... I mean, what happens sometimes... So the reason I mention that is because what happens sometimes, people get a pen from, you know, used from a pen show or something like that, or they have a pen that they had in a drawer 10 years ago. They clean it, they flush it, it still functions, but there's old junk still in there that's impeding the flow. It's not blocking the flow, but it is impeding it. It does need to be more thoroughly cleaned. That's where a soaking or an ultrasonic cleaner could help you because it will more thoroughly clean it. So again, I think like what Drew said, disassemble if you can or soak, flush, all that kind of stuff. And that could help. There you All go. Right. Well, All right, wetter, we've got... Use a wetter ink <laughs> if that, yes. none of that works. Also that. Cool. All right, we've got a message from the Torpedo Monkey, Brian. The Torpedo Monkey? Well, Torpedo Monkey. I thought I it was added. Torpedo Monkey. Oh, oh you know kidding. what? Now that I'm looking at it, you're right. Mm. Torpedo Monkey. <laughs> All right, well, Torpedo Monkey asks, <laughs> why is the Con 40 designed as it is? What's mm. the function of the small metal orbs in the mouth of the <gasps> dot dot dot? We know what you're talking about, Torp. In the mouth, in the mouth of the the torpedo. Yep. 
Sorry, the so uh, Brian the pad, little pad that I was standing on like was kept moving forward on me and moving forward, and like, just all <laughs> all on its own. <clears throat> How about yeah, clearly, that? not anything I did. It just moved on its own. Well, yeah. Brian, the Con Forty pe people have some people have <laughs> questions about that. Like yes. this is this why are why are you the way that you are? Uh, <laughs> a little office reference there. Um, We've all asked that question to the Con Forty before. Yes, what gives you the right? Um, yeah, so pilot pilots had a number of convert. You like how Drew just gave me all these really deep questions this week, and he wants to make fun of me about it. Thanks, Drew. This is good. Drew Drew prepares most. I of the I, notes, I have such confidence. I have such confidence in you, Brian. <laughs> you're, well, you're just... I uh, I will not disappoint. I can't do much worse than we did on that food day question. So um, <laughs> that that you got to have the. I know. I had I had my moments there too, man. <laughs> you got to set good. the standard somewhere. It would have been worse um, if it was my question. It's all good. Um, okay, so Pilot has had a number of converters, probably more converters than I can think of any other pen company having over the years. Agreed. Um, and not just because they've been around a long time, even just since we've been in business, they've had more converters than anybody else I know. Well, they have a lot of simultaneously sold different yeah, converters. It's not they like do. they're just versions or iterations. They like they will sell different yeah. styles of converters. Which during, I love. I yeah. wish we had. I mean, okay, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I should think about how I'm phrasing that. I was going to say, I wish we had more converter options, but it's like there are, it is kind of confusing already which converters go with which pens. So never mind, forget that. I don't wish we had more converter options. <laughs> I wish we had fewer options that worked just better on every pen. There you that's, go. That's what I should say. I don't think but, anybody would disagree with you there. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I'm a tinkerer. So I think having different converters are just neat and I love seeing how they all work, but it is confusing. Um, okay. Anyway, the, uh, I have a video already on the Con 40. It's called How to Fully Fill a Pilot Con 40 Cartridge Converter Pen. So definitely check that out because I'm going to duplicate some of what I talk about here over there. And I have more ma macro video stuff and it'll maybe a little more instructive over there, but can at least give some context uh, here as well. Um, so the goal in designing the Con 40, it's their, I guess, latest you know, new converter that they've done um, was to make something that would fit all the past Pilot and Namiki pens that they've done because they've, I don't know if you heard, but they've been around for a while. So I don't know exactly how far back because I don't really hear of people using Pilot pens that are older than like the original Namiki, Namiki Caplices in like the 70s. So there may be older pens that go back before those, but I haven't really met a lot of people that are using converters in those pens. But um, anyway, so the uh, Con 40 basically has to work in several decades of the latest Pilot and Namiki pens. So that's part of the constraints that they have to work in is there's a lot of historically, you know, available and used pens that whatever new converter that they might design has to be able to be compatible with. Because you can imagine, you know, much like if you're getting a new phone and all of a sudden they change the plug on it and you're like, great, I have like 40 plug accessories that are now outdated and I have to get all new plugs and everything. Or a new super MacBook. Annoying. Yeah. So super annoying. Um, we're used to that in our technology life, but a little more annoying in the pen life. So it is cool that whenever they design a new converter, they are taking that into account. Um, but the way, the, the reason they specifically designed, and because you're talking about the metal orbs, um, which I've never heard them called orbs. I don't know. I just find that very uh, interesting. I like that. Yeah. It sounds very... Uh, I don't know, mystical. Metal um, orbs. Metal orbs, yes. Ah. Floating around inside your converter. So, uh, you know, basically they are agitators. They're little agitator balls. So um, part of the issue that Pilot was having, and we were around for this years ago, uh, when they had the Con 50, before they had any kind of agitator in there. Um, if you think about the way that you're holding a pen, um, you have a pen. This is a bad example because it is a piston, but whatever. You'll get the idea. When you have a pen and it's capped, or the VP kind of works the same way, um, when it's in your pocket or in your pen case or whatever, and you have it with the clip in, the nibs pointing up, your ink is going towards the back of the pen. So all the ink is hanging down here. Well, when you write with it, you're then flipping it over. So that ink needs to be able to fall down, which usually it does without any kind of a problem. But I guess there is an issue sometimes with the old Con 50 converter, where the ink was hanging up in the back of the pen when it was, you know, not completely full, but maybe halfway or a little bit less, the ink was hanging up in the back, which then if the ink's not making contact with the feed, it can't flow through the pen, obviously. So uh, they were having an issue with it seeming like there was 
not a lot of ink capacity with these pens because the ink was hanging up in the back of the converter a lot. So they added this big fat metal agitator in there. And I think I talk about this in the Con40 video, I can't remember. Um, but there was this big fat agitator, which helped with that, but then it took up some of the ink capacity. So I think they went to these tiny little balls so that it would agitate it, but not take up a whole ton of space because again, they're constrained on the size of the converter. They try to make the ink capacity as great as they can within its constraints, but you got to fit the mechanism in there and all that. And then when you have an agitator in there, you got a lot of conflicting different physical properties that are all competing with each other. And this was the greatest compromise that they were able to come up with. Um, so, you know, it kind of is what it is. And they're not the only ones with an agitator. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I know that Monograppa has had a little agitator in some of their converters, not all of them, but they've had it sometimes. Um, I'm trying to remember if there's other- Cartridges have done it. Cartridges, yeah. There's a lot of cartridges. Um, Platinum has a big metal ball that seals up their cartridge. Um, but even just your regular standard international cartridge, that is actually sealed. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it's sealed with a little plastic ball. And when you puncture that, uh, that little ball actually detaches completely from the front of the cartridge. And it will then be you know, knocking around inside uh, inside of the cartridge. So I guess part of it is to to help agitate like that. So why why Pilot went specifically with, I think it's three little agitator balls, three or four, um, why they went with multiple balls? I guess they did testing and they just determined that was what was best for them, uh, for what they were trying to do. And I, I don't know, they didn't like tell us exactly why they design everything that they design, but I imagine they did some degree of testing um, in order to find what would agitate the best. And uh, that's what they came up with. So that's what they're there for. And uh, yeah, not completely unheard of to have some orbs in your converter, but I think Pilot, just because they're one of the most well-known brands and because so many people are getting pens with these converters on them, uh, they're just the most well-known for having this particular thing. So that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I know about it. And obviously, the uh, there's a metal gate or a metal cage of some sort that actually stops mm. the balls from going past, you know, where they should. So that's in there yeah. too. But that's yeah. pretty obvious. Yeah, because otherwise the orbs would then come out of the converter when you get <laughs> it. Does make me wonder, like, what what what's stopping the orbs in like the uh, cartridges from plugging the hole? Um, well, oh, the because post, the, the post goes up. Never mind. Yeah, well, question. well, also they're like you know they're they're even if you even if you take a, a cartridge out and it's empty, you can see the little ball kind of rattling around in there. It's because I guess when they seal it somehow they like put. I I don't actually know how this process works because I've never seen it done, um, but I imagine they have that ball. The ball is like placed in place, and then they like seal the cartridge kind of around the ball. So when you're poking it in, the ball physically will not be able to just with gravity fall out of the opening of the converter or the, the cartridge um you would have to like push it to, to yeah. dislodge it and yeah. when you're dislodging it into it then it's you know it's not going to come out so yeah there you go learning all kinds of things today all right captain quark asked best not so hard to maintain noodler's inks i don't know if this came after the Base state blue conversation we've had the last couple of pencasts, but I think it I think it may have um, <laughs> yeah, probably well in my experience I, I if it uh, if an ink and this goes with any ink not just noodlers but if it looks like there's a whole lot going on in an ink then treat it like there's a whole lot going on that could impede your progress be it you know if you've got a heavy sheen heavy shimmer that also says it's permanent forever like. Mm. All, there has to be stuff added to that ink to make it do those things. Mm. And any one of those things could make it a little bit more difficult to maintain. So if you want something that's easy to maintain across any brand, you know, just go with something a little more simple as far as its features go. Don't look for something heavy on the features. Um, so water resistance is the only feature that I don't think would incorporate any sort of element that would make it high maintenance. That, that uh, Water resistance usually just means it's um absorbs more and there's a per uh um yeah anyway I, I don't think that one necessarily but when in doubt if it has a whole lot going on on it just don't don't even I think, um yeah, so sa saturate sorry yeah what? i was gonna say like it's it's hard to say one particular property 
will or will not be more maintenance because especially with noodlers sometimes you get inks with overlapping properties yeah so you can't really say this category of property it could be the cocktail will, or will not have problems because it may be that that aspect of it will not cause you problems but there may be other things going on yeah because i'm thinking of a number of different noodlers inks that have very interesting things going on with it where it's like oh well most of the waterproof ones are not a problem in maintaining your pens but there are some that do anyway yeah um so saturated color is one that you know will always be there's more dye in it if it's a super super mm. super vibrant color that means there's a ton of dye in there that's what makes it so pretty um that could make it a little bit harder but generally speaking most noodlers inks is just fine as far as maintenance goes there are some that are there are higher maintenance but um i've been using them for you know greater part of a decade and i haven't had a ton of problems um permanence is also one you want to consider that's definitely a factor that could make it a little bit more difficult because its job is to stick around uh lighter colors are almost always going to be easier to maintain than darker more saturated colors that being said putting on my brian Goulet hat there are exceptions um yeah. so like noodler's uh, eternal inks those are very subdued kind of watery looking colors but yet they're super permanent, they're eternal. So there's gonna mm. be some black magic in there that makes them eternal. So not the best for ease of maintenance. So there are exceptions for sure, but generally speaking, lighter, more watery colors are easier. But you know, with yeah. noodlers especially, there are exceptions. Um, in my experience, the ones, ones that I have used for more than five years with regularity and have never had a problem with are Midway Blue, Lexington Gray, Cactus, uh, green cactus eel, cayenne habanero and Apache, all those orangey reds, I love them. They've never given me a problem. Uh, Navajo turquoise and Noodler's Navy. Also, Noodler's Black. I've used Noodler's Black more than any other ink ever, and it's never given me a hard time, ever. Not staining, not um, pen maintenance, nothing. It, it is, you know, a really well done ink, and it's easy to clean. Brian's had it on his face, and it cleaned off just fine. Yeah. It was surprisingly easy. It's surprisingly easy to clean off your skin, actually. <laughs> it is. It's not bad at all. Yeah. So th those are ones that I can say that just based on personal experience of a long time, like I didn't try these inks just once. I've used all of these multiple times a lot. Yeah. So they've never given me a hard time. There are definitely more, but just from my own experience, this is my list. Yeah. You have any thoughts, Brian? Uh, yeah, these are all great points. I think it's so tough when you're generalizing around a brand that has a lot of different properties, especially Noodlers, like maybe more than any other brand, because it is so difficult to make broad sweeping generalizations because you're dealing with so many different properties. So it's got to be nuanced quite a bit. Um, but I think a couple general things that I can mention here to add to what Drew's already said um, is that diluting the ink is always an option. You know, whatever, especially because you're dealing, Noodlers is heavily saturated. Nathan himself is very proud of how, dilute, how uh, saturated these inks are with dye. Most of the time he is saturating them as much as they possibly can be you know, filled with dye because he wants you to have the absolute maximum economy and value that you can possibly get. You know what he needs to do? He needs to get out of the ink business and work on potato chips and beef jerky because... Yeah, what is up with that? And but cereal and all these things? Like, what <laughs> what is up with the potato chips? I know, I've like watched YouTube videos where they're like, well, when they ship them from the factory, they're more full and they settle in transit. And I'm like, really though? Like, they're like a third the way full. Like, come on, come yeah, on. It's unacceptable. Fill my bag, fill it with chip crumbs. I don't care, I want more <laughs> chips in my bag. Like, I feel like I'm getting ripped off. Anyway. I mean, uh, with chips, I get it, because they say that like air kind of helps protect them, but with beef jerky, you've, mm. got, you've got that much bag and that much, I don't even eat beef jerky, but still, it bothers me. I'm like, why so mm. much bag? That's wasteful. Unless it needs like room to breathe or off gas or something. I don't know. I don't know. Beef jerky is like its own thing. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I digress this time. You do digress. Yeah. Thanks for getting us <laughs> off track. Like I need a distraction. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So I would say that uh, dilution, you know, particularly with Noodler's inks because they're so saturated, very encouraged. It just diluting it with uh, with uh, bibbidi bop shibbidi distilled distilled water, right? Distilled Dy dystopian dystopian water. Yeah, mm -hmm. soylent green. I'm just kidding. Um, no, distilled water. So water with no minerals, no nothing in it um, is uh, is ideal. Uh, you can do it in 
test it out in small amounts first, you know, a 10%, 20% dilution, something like that. But basically if you're diluting it, you're, you know, you're, you're, well, you're diluting it. You're, you're having less of the things that could potentially cause maintenance issues, you know, because you're just adding water to it. So, um, could give you some, you know, we usually we talk about dilution in terms of, you know, um, how it'll flow or how it'll perform on the page or how it'll look with shading and stuff like that. Uh, but there could absolutely be a benefit or a reason to dilute uh, certain colors if you um, want easier maintenance. So the more water there is, the, the easier it'll be to clean uh, to a point. So, uh, and then I would say just cleaning on a more regular basis, especially not letting your ink get to the point where it's like, dried up and not flowing in the pen anymore, then you're gonna be into a little bit more of a cleaning rehab as opposed to just a regular flushing. So I would say, you know, the, and again, that that speaks to the same thing. You're just, you're keeping a higher, you know, higher level of dilution uh, involved. It will be easier to clean. So, um, you know, that that's a general rule, not just with noodlers, but with all inks, but in general, cleaning your pens more regularly is a, is a good thing. All right, we who I feel like we stumbled our way through that Q and A this week, Drew. Um, it was a rough one this week. It was a rough, but that's okay. And it's like it's raining outside off and on. I left the windows open. Maybe I'm thinking that was a mistake, but it's okay. It's not raining like sideways, so I don't think it's coming into the house. But yeah, it's a bit dreary. Know, if you see me running to the side, then you know that my <laughs> my floor is getting wet because <laughs> the rain is coming in sideways. Uh, but anyway. That's all we got for Q&A. Let's, uh, let's uh, talk about the tip of the week here, Drew. Okay, so for the tip of this week, it is a little bit of a public service announcement Ooh. brought to you by okay. your Goulet Pen Company customer care team. Hmm. Um, it was requested that I provide our pen friends with a friendly reminder about the Caveco pen and the Caveco converter. Mm. We have a Is lot this of that folks. Little, that little one, that little. That's the little one. Yeah, like little do that. Look so at that. Cool. It's so tiny. Boop. So, in addition, you know what? I'll give you a freebie too. When you get your brand new Quebeco pen, in the barrel, there's going to be a cartridge. Mm. So don't try to yeah, put people, in this yeah. little dude without taking that off first. Sometimes it sticks oh, in the yeah. back, and even even doing this is, won't oh, get yeah. it out. Sometimes but trust people me, don't realize it's in there. It? Yeah, sometimes people put the converter in and then they end up jamming the cartridge back in there even more so. Or depressing the converter and or causing ink to... Or, or all of the above, and then all they're the just above. like, what is happening to my pen yep. right now? Yeah. So the PSA is that this little guy, this cute little guy right here, is insanely difficult to insert into the grip mm. section. Um, so much so that we get folks saying it's defective, I need to return it, it's not working. And yeah, it does not feel like a standard converter as far as the pressure needed to fit it in. You need to shove it really hard. And I have one here, I'm going to, this is this this would get a normal converter in. The amount of pressure I'm putting forth right now, it's not, it's not going. But really, if I slam it in there, it, it's mm. fine. It is very tight, it's not gonna go anywhere now. And then, you know, uh, it just requires some extra pressure. So don't be afraid of pushing it a little bit harder. You're not going to hurt the converter. The post mm -hmm. is very, very rigid on these pens. It's not mm -hmm. one of those bendable posts. Like the interior nib units of these things are robust. They are. So just really, obviously, you don't want to ever grab the nib. Really just get a solid grip on the grip section and shove it in as hard as you can. It'll mm -hmm. go. Trust yeah. us. It'll work. But this is something that does trip a lot of users up. And you're excited to get your beautiful rose gold all sport. And we want you to be excited. We don't want you to be having a hard time. So please remember, mm. you get one of these little converters. They require a little bit of extra mustard or gusto mm. to get in. Now, to nuance that, I would, oh boy. I think, I don't know, I don't have this specifically because I haven't like, super tested just the Quaco little mini converter here but the most converters if they are difficult to get in the first time it's not maybe as difficult periodically after that i don't know what's your feeling drew since you've just done it multiple times do you feel like uh, it did it, it did not get any easier but maybe no? if i did it you know 50 more okay. times it would well, that's good to know good to know okay all right well forget what i said it's hard no, i mean i'm sure it'll eventually happen no you gotta want it you just gotta you gotta really want it with the Quaco. Like if you're if you're determined to use that teeny little converter, you really must want it bad. So you just gotta go for it. Yeah. Yep. 
All right. Now we're going to move on to our pen spotlight. Or are we? Well, no, we're not. We're skipping this week. So Drew and I, we were like talking, oh, what do you know? We ended up having a short week, you know, because we had a three-day weekend, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But we also had to shoot a day early because of a schedule conflict I had. So we had less time than usual to prep this one. And we were like, yeah, okay. We don't want to just make something up and you know, do it halfway. So we're going to do it no way and just tell you that we need some ideas for pens that we you want to see us that, and That's something that we also talked about. What have people been asking yeah. for? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. They haven't really been asking for stuff. So ask for some yeah. stuff and we'll talk about it. Ask and you shall receive not the pens, but our words about the pens. So yeah, let us know in the comments what you want to see us uh, talk about and we will talk about them in future pencasts. As long so. as it's not a food a nib. Mm. I mean, we can talk about it. Clearly, we don't have to know anything about it to talk about it. So, we'll just I don't want to subject. I don't want to subject our pen friends to that again. <laughs> They've already. If you're listening this far, I, I applaud your patience. Yeah, absolutely. You got to have a lot of patience to watch this pencast in the first place. All right, now uh, let's check out what's happening. Drew, I see in your notes that you were duped by McDonald's. What, I was Brian. What I was very. That? I was, very I was very offended. So <laughs> um, yesterday was a half day at school and uh, mm -hmm. we hadn't gotten groceries yet. So we were a little, you know, desperate. So I told my son I'd take him by McDonald's, get him a happy meal after, mm. after school. So I did. As I approach the menu, I look over and I see this, this, this signage that says land, sea, and air. And it showed a, a burger that had a filet fish patty a McChicken patty and a burger patty on it. And I was like, wait a minute. Birds don't, uh, chickens don't fly. They have feathers and they flap that, and they can, mm, they can, they can be airborne for a period of time. Uh, I would argue there are some fish that can fly better than chickens. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Either way, I saw this monstrosity and I was like, oh, that's disgusting. I need it. Um, so I was like, yeah, give me this land, sea and air thing and they're like all right cool you know you want a combo i was like yeah of course i'm already I, you know health is not no longer a concern of mine um that went out the window when you pulled into that yeah, drive through absolutely um so i get home and there's no sandwich there's three separate sandwiches there's the filet fish the mixed chicken and the big mac and i was offended Did they they really expect me to disassemble these burgers have extra buns laying around and f and and construct my own monstrosity of garbage like do you know how messy that is if you've ever gotten a fast food burger and needed to remove something it's a mess like those I things mean, once they're once they're constructed it's 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 just a well i was gonna say often it comes in like the burger is halfway off the bun and you have to like reconstruct it just to yeah, but make all it the, what it's supposed to all be the, in the, first the thing place. that you want to remove is like stuck to something else and it's just it's not fun like who wants to dive into three different burger replacement scenarios not i not i said the drew so how much was this thing did it cost like twelve dollars or something like i would think it, that i don't know i didn't really pay attention to that but yeah. in retrospect, I, I suppose I just did order three burgers, so I was not happy about that. I was disappointed, and yeah, I did not, I did not make it. You got a really lazy, you know, no, I didn't. I, who would, like they already I had ate, them assembled, uh, and they were like, just throw all three in. No, there. I gave my wife the Big Mac. I ate the chicken and half the fish. I was, I was just disappointed and sad at that point. And it's not like I wanted to. I didn't want it bad enough. I'm like, all right, if you're gonna give it to me, I will, I will consume this thing just for fun. But I'm not putting it together. Come mm. on now, making me do that. So anyway, that was the down, the down part of my weekend, um, or long weekend, as it were. Uh, but I did get to do some journaling. I jumped back into the garden planning, still doing that. Hey. Revised my initial planning, not doing 10 square feet in my planter, doing eight, slimming it down a little bit, giving my okay. plants room to breathe. I yeah. ordered my seeds. Um, I will say though, Brian, I'm going to take a break on shimmer uh, sorry sheen inks because i'm yeah. noticing uh, with this journal at least i'm referencing it a lot it's it's data from mm. last year i'm going back and you know adding things and 
sheen just rubs off too much it doesn't dry the way i want it to so mm. if it was like a letter and i was just trying to send somebody something nice and i knew they weren't going to keep it then i think sheen is beautiful and wonderful and i have been using my winter miracle in my vac 700 and been using that for letters primarily mm. but uh for journaling no i'm going to be done with it for journaling i just don't like the way it uh handles paper um so taking a taking a break on that that kind of calls and, back to what the uh, question that we had uh, earlier about like the ink particles dislodging and stuff like that and sheen and all that. So yeah, I think you're right that this, those inks are not primarily designed for like archivable and referenceability. No, they definitely, they, they, it looks like my stuff from last year looks all smeary and it's just mm. not pretty. So it makes me a little sad. So I'm learning. Are you, are you like gardening? Like I don't garden. I tried once and just it's not for me um the uh even though i spend a lot more time outside which is weird i just don't like to garden but anyway the um are you like referencing this i don't know i'm picturing you in like a bonnet with like you know your little gardening belt or something i don't know what people wear when they garden but like little gloves on are you like journaling in the garden like outside while you're gardening like is dirt no and it's too cold I mean, not uh, maybe now, but like later no. on. You no, know? no, no. I don't do anything outside unless I have to. Okay, so you're not dealing with like potentially like water exposure and no. like dirty hands and stuff no, like that. No, this is just the uh, okay. this is the this is the book that I keep here. Like I'm using okay. my little thing. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, not 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 great for ref referenceability. Yeah, because I'm gonna just say. I'm, I the reason I brought that up is because sheening inks in particular, if you get them wet, will like reconstitute and smear like crazy. Oh yeah, no, no, so no, if you, no like, risk there. If you're using them in any referenceable type of situation where water exposure, like if you like to write outside in your garden with the sprinklers that might turn on or I don't know. Um, <laughs> You know, that's something you should take into consideration for your ink choice. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. But really what I took out of this is that I need a gardening bonnet. So uh, I'll oh work gosh, on that. Drew. I, I need to see your gardening outfit. I don't have a, I don't do, I don't have outfits. Like whenever I do outside work, you know, which I do, I, I'm a homeowner. It, it has to happen. But I just, it's, okay. it's, it's not ever planned. It's just, mm. I get random motivation. So I will go outside in whatever I happen to be wearing, which is always... <laughs> shoes that will get stained green that I should have changed into my jankety shoes and I didn't. <laughs> yes. I never, I never prepare yeah. for outdoor work ever. I'm always out there in something that's too hot or too cold that mm. stains, gets dirty stuff. Like my night, I'm wearing my nice watch. I don't put on my, uh, my, my, um, oh golly, what's that thing that I bought specifically for outdoor work? The Casio G-Shock. I did, I, I'm supposed to put on my G-Shock to but no, I bought it just for that, but I never put the darn thing on. I'm terrible. I'm absolutely, but it all, I, but when I have motivation ha happen, it just, I just need to do it. Like mm -hmm. I can't, I sometimes can't prepare. I need to strike while the iron is hot, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, oh, you, you know what you, you, you mentioned singing earlier in this pencast and torturing me and how I much did. it upset me. You did. Yeah. You, you threatened, you threatened that. Yeah. Uh, I went over to my brother's house on Saturday night. He bought a uh, pizza oven, like a home pizza oven, and he was cooking pizza for friends. So uh, my wife, my kid, and I went over there, and um, I'm just kind of playing with the kid down in the basement um, because social, yay. And my wife is uh, obviously upstairs mingling and talking, and uh, someone says, oh, you're a singer. I wish you could sing. sing. Could you sing a song? And she's like, notices that I'm within earshot, and she's like, yes, I can. And... <laughs> She looks at me, she's like, only because it's going to upset my husband. And it's just, I, I, I just, she just starts singing and everybody's just quiet. That's all you hear. And I just had to, I was like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. But Trish, she's course, a good singer. I she's know, a that's really not good the, singer. She is, but that's not the point. You're a good singer too, Brian. I'll give you credit, but yeah. I, that's not the point. I can't, I have an inability to not, I, I have to put my, I can't not put myself in that person's position. Mm. And when I do that, it's terrifying because I, I I choke and get afraid and like my mouth dries up. And I can't <laughs> perform like that. That freaks me out so much. I get such mm. anxiety. So when I see other people doing it, I can't help but think, how would I feel if I was? Do oh God, you know. And see, that's so funny, Drew, <sighs> because I imagine anybody watching this, they're like, you're sitting here performing like to a degree right now. 
right? Yes, to a degree. But like when when I have things that I that I feel passionate about, like if you say like, "Hey, Drew, you know, could you rank the Star Wars?" I'm like, yes, listen to me, and I will I will speak to three <laughs> three thousand people. If it's rank, about like, all right, I have things Star to say. I have things to say <laughs> about this. Quiet, eyes on me. Um, then then that that's fine. But if you say, "Hey, Drew, do your Kermit impression," I'm like, "Uh, no, no, no," and I will run away. Like that that's performing. Mm. And then that that's different. When it crosses the line into performing, that's where I like. Oh, I can, my mouth's drying up just thinking about it. Mm. <sighs> but anyway, she tortured me and just thought it was hilarious. And then of course everybody's like, "Oh, you don't like hearing your wife sing?" I'm like, "No, that's not it." And then I have to explain it, and it doesn't make any sense. Mm. But yeah, she did that. You would have you would have got a kick out of my pain and agony. So there you yeah. have that. <sighs> that's awesome. Makes anyway, me smile. Makes me smile yeah, just thinking you. of yeah, her you're singing welcome. while you're... You're welcome. You enjoy yeah, that. While you're yeah, in hang pain. On, hang on to that. Yeah, well, that's that's what yeah. I get. Drew's, um, discom- Drew's discomfort just, like, feeds me. I'm like a I'm like the Emperor from Star Wars. Except with dad jokes like, instead of I'm lightning bolts. I'm just, like, bolts. sucking Drew's it's just, discomfort but it's just, it's, out but of him. It's, it's bad jokes coming out of your fingertips. <laughs> mm, <sighs> yes. Anyway, I bought a new coin. You bought a coin? Yes, so you, I ordered... You bought I, money with money? You I bought different money? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought a coin off eBay. Um, haven't oh. bought a coin in a while. Okay. But uh, tell, I was ta- tell me about this coin. I will. I will. I was talking to some friends, and uh, they were talking about Death on the Nile, the new um, uh, Poirot movie with the like the sequel to uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Anyway. Oh. Okay. Uh, and then that led us to talking about Knives Out, which was the Daniel Craig murder mystery, and. I said, man, you know what? I love that movie. Uh, he was flipping a uh, Morgan dollar in that movie, but I never figured out what year it was. And then my friend Jeffrey was like, well, why don't you just Google it? So mm. I did. I'm like, it's a 1901. I don't have a 1901 yet. So I got one. Nice. Yeah. So because he like throughout the movie, he's flipping this, uh, you know, and I paused it when I watched it. I was like, "Ooh, what kind of what kind of coin is that? Mm. And it was a Morgan dollar, um, which mm. uh, was kind of like a late 1800s um, uh, coin. That was feel, replaced by the. I, f- uh, I feel like we could add this to the list of how you know you're a serial hobbyist. If you ever pause a movie or TV show to look close up on some accessory to see exactly what it is, you you might you might have a problem. Well, we've I'm sure we've all done that to fountain pens. Oh, absolutely. Um, and oh, I believe you know, when I, I was... saw when I saw Inglorious Bastards, and he you know inked out the pen. I was like, what? What pen, what pen is that? Like, yeah, like, I'm pretty sure I saw like, an, took the whole scene from me. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I saw an ST Dupont on Spectre when we watched that the other day. That I could see that because they had a that. Bond pen around that same time. Yeah, they did. They did mm-hmm. a cigar lighter too that was so cool. It mm-hmm. had like so a I'm, like a bullet hole through the lighter, which was just crazy looking. That is cool. It was like because it was like a spiral, like the barrel of the gun with a yeah, hole like the rifling the lighter. Yeah, yeah, Very that cool. is cool. But they don't yeah, sell their so, lighters, but they, SC DuPont has ridiculous lighters. They, they're incredible. Yeah, they're cool. So, yeah, anyway. Very cool. cool. coins. All right. Did you get your talk boy yet? I'm going to keep I'm not getting a talk you. boy, Brian. Okay. Not All ordering right. a talk boy. Right, no, we'll I don't see. have, a, I don't have, a, I don't have, a, I don't have like a toy shelf, which is good, which is good. Oh. If I don't, if I don't get a toy, then I won't mm. have a place to put the toy. Okay. But as soon as I do, then there will be a toy area. And as long as I don't create a toy area, mm. there will be no purchasing of toys. So if I want to troll Drew, I need to like order a, a shelf, a shelf piece of furniture, get like an Ikea thing like delivered to his house. And uh, he'll just have new shelves to fill oh, with God, no, that'd random be mean. collections of things. <laughs> oh, that'd be mean. Or like the worst thing you could do would be to buy like, a Funko figure that is like one of mm. like buy a Leonardo from Ninja Turtles and then Ooh. buy like you know another character from another franchise a Power and then Ranger like, and then but then you've already got a Power Ranger right you've got uh, yes yes got I do have one Power Ranger which doesn't belong on my just one which, yeah I know I know it's been just one been that's a, yes just they, the one they, they have others don't they nope nope no they don't. No. I bet if I bought, I bet if I bought you a second one. Nope, don't even. Then you would, you could not Mm-mm. stand having. To, I'm gonna buy you like the yellow, the yellow ranger, Mm-mm. and you'd be, be like, this doesn't make any sense now. Why do I have Mm-mm. just the white and the yellow ranger? Mm-mm. I have to get. The I would other hide. Ones. I would. I would. I would hide it. I would donate it to <laughs> someone that doesn't have my problems. Uh, <sighs> that's, that's it for me. Again, this is me 
just drawing off of Drew's discomfort for power. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So what have I been up to? I've uh, had a lot of family time. We had a three day weekend. It was a lot of fun. We got to, uh, the weather was really interesting for us here in central Virginia. It, it was pretty warm and then it got really cold and then it got really warm again. So that was very interesting. Um, so yeah, this is just welcome to late winter as we approach spring in Virginia. Uh, and now it's raining like all week, but the sun's kind of out. So I don't know what's happening. Not over here. Yeah, it's raining, raining pretty good over here, but anyway. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my daughter really wanted to go to the park. Um, you know, and we have like room to run around and stuff like that, but you know, you get to go and they have all the various play things. I don't know, whatever you call them, the, the junk you climb on and slide down and whatever things with nets on them, you know, that kind of stuff. We don't have like that kind of stuff at our house. Um, so she really wanted to go to the park. So it was like, okay, cool. Monday, you know, we're off, whatever. We're not working. We'll go. The weather's going to be beautiful. Well, we didn't really think about the fact that friggin' everybody else would also be going to the park. So we get there and there's like probably four and a half million kids at this mm -hmm. park. And, you know, we live kind of rurally. So we had to drive a little bit to get there. And uh, we get there and she's just like, nope. She's like, ah, this is too many kids. I don't want to do this. So she was kind of disappointed. And she was like, can we go to this other park? Which was like a half an hour away. And we were like, no, we're not doing that because we're going to get there and it's going to be just as crowded because it's a beautiful day on a day when a lot of kids have off school because it was a holiday, President's Day. And it was just like, yeah, sorry. So, you know, that was that was a thing. She was so you were like, let's go home. You can help me build a build, build a mud bridge. Um, I mean, you know, I offered that as consolation, <laughs> but surprisingly, didn't didn't cut it. She wasn't. Uh, she wasn't super oh man, about it. yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Um, yeah. So I mean, it happens. We were just like, well, that stinks. You know, she's. Uh, you know, we didn't. We yeah, we didn't really think about it either. But whatever, it happened. So you know, we're still navigating this whole COVID coming out of things and socializing with people. And, you know, that kind of stuff, even an outdoor type thing. It's like, yeah, okay, you know what? We're good. Um, so we, like, there was like a hill at this little park. So she rolled down the hill a few times and then kind of sat there and felt some feelings. And then uh, we left and came back home. So we went to a park and then left. So such is life. Um, Did you roll down the hill? Did I roll down the hill? Mm -hmm. No, if I roll down that hill, I ain't, get, I ain't getting back up. Like, that's not... <laughs> You know, I remember being around 10 or so where, you know, I, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to roll down this hill. I remember this being fun as a kid and I rolled down the hill and I was like, I think I might be getting too old for this. Like <laughs> my body kind of hurts now and I have yeah. a bit of a headache. Like I don't remember feeling this much pain before. I, I don't enjoy this anymore. And, uh, and I don't think I've ever rolled down a hill since then. I probably. remember when that happened with getting dizzy as a kid getting dizzy used to be fun yeah and then all of a sudden it's like oh no like, this no. is this, this is, is awful this is something to avoid now right not something to try to experience exactly it, what like yeah. they're like little kids love getting dizzy <laughs> they, they think it's hilarious and then you hit 10 and you're like this is this is awful yeah this is garbage no thank you yeah so uh no i did not roll down the hill and joseph didn't either like so ellie just rolled down the hill herself a couple times but yeah, that was cool. Um, I did do some uh, some of Brian's outdoor adventures a little bit. Um, not anything really that thrilling. Nothing as exciting as you know digging out holes in the mud. How's the bridge coming? These kind of things. The bridge is done. Oh, okay. Yeah, I finished it. Yeah, it's passable. so. So, so, so the picture from last week was that in progress or was that that done? was in that was in progress? But I, yeah, I mean, I I. I finished so it we, a couple days so after that. We, yeah. we need an update then. You're going to give us an, an updated update picture? picture? Yeah, right. I have an updated picture. Yeah, yeah. All right. Have yeah, you we'll driven anything we'll across it? Uh, yeah, successfully. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it didn't yep. sink down? Didn't sink down. Not yet, nice. but we're getting like a week of rain this week, and I'm like, oh boy, this will really test All right. it. All so, right. Yeah, we'll see. We'll the see. epic it continues. Look, it doesn't look the prettiest in retrospect. I'm like, oh, probably should have prepped and planned it a little better at the onset because i was like i'm just going to lay some stuff on top of it and then once i did i was like oh this looks like really intentional now but i didn't uh whatever it's fine it's nature i don't really care no one cares except no one but um anyway so it's it's functional it's passable that was the goal um but so i finished that i actually finished that by i think by the time that the pentecost had gone out last week so this weekend i was on to a new project which is um 
I've got, you know, I've got a, a yard and then I've got woods like right at the edge of the yard. And there's like not much of a transition, right? So like woods, woods are happening. There's yard happening. Sunlight comes th to the edge of the woods. And there's all this like just stuff, random stuff that just grows at the edge of the woods, you know? So like inside the woods, it's like trees and you can walk through it and all that kind of stuff. But the edge of the woods, it's like briars and vines and yep. just garbage. I know and exactly like, what you're talking about. That's the stuff that you see as you're looking into the woods. And I'm like, I want to see like the beautiful woods. I don't want to yeah. see the garbagey, viney mess. And then like, you know, I live rurally. So when the leaves fall, I ain't picking up those leaves. I'm just going to blow them into the woods because it's nature and it's right there. But when you get all these briars and vines and junk like that, it all holds back the leaves and then you're, fight, you know, and it's just like, this is nasty. So I was, mm -mm, I've, been working, I've been working on ripping out all the briary, viney garbage at the edge of my woods. So it's not a super exciting project necessarily. And it's one of those things you're like, you're just like removing things and kind of cleaning it up. So it's not like, look at this thing I built. It was not here and now it is. You're like, look, there was stuff here, but now it's not. And you're like, well, what was there before? You don't really notice or care. So I have a giant, several, excuse me, giant piles of brush now, <laughs> instead of it being at the edge of the woods. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to get it there. And uh, you know, briars are awful and they scratch you up like crazy and i'm really allergic to poison ivy and i have it everywhere here so i have to be really careful when i do this kind of work so um you know it gets a little crazy but i'm really glad that i'm doing this now because i'm like yeah this looks so much better so that's been my outdoor adventure um but i wanted to get it done now because you know what's going to happen as soon as it gets really warm all the bugs are going to come out and then everything is going to like bloom and then i'm going to be dealing with really like wet heavy leafy Ugh. garbage so i'm Ugh. like i'm at the edge of winter here i need to do this now before everything starts blooming again and the bugs mm -hmm. come out and it gets 90 degrees out and yep. so that's why i'm prioritizing that now um i uh i ordered some new puzzles some more 3d puzzles because i uh you know haven't looked at any new ones in a while and every now and then they design some new ones that are like variations of other ones that i like and uh you know puzzles are relatively cheap so uh i get to buy new ones every now and then i'm like oh interesting they have a double layered version of this other puzzle that i like and uh it's more complicated so a giga you know. mega ultra monkey minx yeah a scooby multi dodecahedron is one of the ones that i ordered what yeah scooby scooby yeah a scube yeah a scube is a sp particular type of puzzle instead of like turning, you know, like a regular puzzle, you'll you'll turn the faces of it. Well, skew, it's like cut through the puzzle, and you're turning like basically half the puzzle at a time at its angles. So it's I just want to say that I want to say that in a sha shaggy voice, like, oh, let's go, skew. Yeah, it does kind of sound like that. Yeah, so that one I don't know. I don't love the skew because it is it messes with my brain a little bit more. It's a little harder for me to deal with. But this one, it's a dodecahedron, so it's twelve sided. And it's a scube, and it has like a ball within the outer layer. So as you turn the outer layer, the inner layer also turns, but at a different ratio. So I don't know. It's like this. It, it, this one's gonna break my brain, but um, you know, I like to do that every now and then. It's it's fun. As we yeah, talked about, it, <laughs> it broke my brain first. Yeah, but then they Just have cool puzzles. Like I got a regular three by three Rubik's cube that, um, instead of having the colors printed on it, it's made to look like a cheeseburger. And Joseph, oh, that's cool. Oh, Joseph loves cheeseburgers. I have another one that's like the periodic table of elements. I have another one that's, you know, got like dollar bills on it. I have another one that's a Sudoku puzzle. Do you have to? Do Rubik's you ever section. like? Do you have like a puzzle palette cleanser? If you have like a truly brain melting puzzle, do you like have like a e easy yeah. like, legitimately fun one that you kind of like? Oh, let yeah, me yeah. go to this one to kind of. Oh sure, I have, my, I have my like tried and true ones to yeah, go to. Yeah, yeah, cool. Because like puzzles, the way they're designed, it's like there's, you know, there's usually certain formats, and then the bigger, more complex ones will have a lot of the same algorithms for the base puzzle, but there's just some added complexity to it. So it's not like every new puzzle you get, you got to figure it all out all over again. It's and, and there's a lot of things that will transfer over from like one multi-layered puzzle to another style of multi-layered puzzle there's just a little bit of a twist to it you know um huh, play on words nah. but, you know, yeah so it's like i like them because 
I don't know, sometimes they just feel really cool when you're turning them. Sometimes there's like a visual just component that looks really neat as you're solving it. Sometimes it literally is just like, wow, these, it's just really complex in how to solve it and it kind of breaks your brain. Um, yeah, so it's, there's a lot of just crazy things. I mean, it's not unlike pens when you're dealing with different pens. It's like, okay, they all function in similar ways, but you might really like the way one filling mechanism feels or the way that one nib, you know, writes in particular, even if it's the same model, you know, so you get variations of things and you just, you know, the deeper you get into it, the more you appreciate the nuances. So yeah, I am, again, as a, a multi-hobbyist, <laughs> I would fall into the multiple hobbies at once uh, type, you know, uh, as is evidenced by when I talk about what I'm doing week to week. Um, so that I think that's the way to go fun. personally, because then if you can't do one of the hobbies, like if my hobby was just kayaking, mm. I would only really be able to fill that void, yeah, you know, you know at certain parts of the year. So it's helpful to have a bunch of them so that if one of yeah. them is inaccessible for a given period of time, you have that other one to bring you joy. I'm with you on that one, because I think especially depending on what the hobby is, like I really like doing the the 3d puzzle thing but it's a it's a solo activity like you're not doing this like we're not doing this as a family so like i have certain activities that i'll do like with the family but then it's like when i have five minutes and i'm just waiting for whatever the kids to get ready and get their shoes on or whatever i can just pick up a puzzle and be like do 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 and kind of do it on my own so i, I like to have things as kind of gap fillers or i'm not going to be out there doing outdoor activities when it's like pouring rain unless i absolutely have to so i like to mix things up like that because then you got options you got options. But I will say that if you are starting a new serial hobby like that um, and you're like intermixing it in with everything else that you're doing, it takes a really long time to get over the hump to the point where you like really enjoy it. So usually when I start a new hobby, I get like overly into that new hobby until I get to the point where I'm more comfortable and familiar with it. And then I more intermix it in with everything else I've got going on. So anyway. Yep. Um, and then last but not least, um, Rachel and I are doing our taxes and working on our annual development reviews and lots of adulty stuff that we're doing. Yeah. So there's plenty of that going on too, which is why it's like, I'll do that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I, my eyes are crossed. I need to go do something fun and move my body because we're just staring at numbers. And yeah. And, and, like and <laughs> just so folks know, like the Goulet pen company does not, uh, half ass their development reviews. Like it's something that they, yeah, it, they're very, they're, they're very good. Yeah. They're very good. They're very in depth. They're very helpful. They're truly, you know, but, but that means that a lot needs to go into them. So, yeah. Yeah. Like at the moment I have seven direct reports. Every single person has a entirely different role. And uh, I think I have like six or eight supporting different documents that go into the development review that I have to like pull from and, you know, it's, it's, it's. We also do 360 evaluations. So every mm -hmm. person evaluates each member of their team. So the managers yep. have to evaluate all those and distribute, you know, mm -hmm. the proper type of information to each person. It's. It's a thing. It's not it's like, a, you know, it's, it's not like you are you are satisfactory. Checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. Here you go. Yeah. Or like Rachel had a past job. I won't say where, but she had a past job where she had to do her self-evaluation and they literally just took her self-evaluation and turned it into her evaluation. She was like, well, I'm glad I said good things about myself, but it was like, I don't think that's probably how it's supposed that's to be That's not how done. it's supposed to work. No. Nope. But anyway, that's not how we do it. But yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's uh, that's what I've been up to. Um, and then, you know, Drew, some people were asking like, hey, what about the company updates? We haven't been doing it all the time. And I was like, well, sometimes it's not that much exciting stuff to talk about week to week. We're just kind of doing our thing, but I figured why not? Let's do some company updates. We can also just say that we know that we misspell company updates. Oh yeah, that was on purpose. Uh, that was like a, an episode one typo yeah. that is forever now yeah exactly and company and we just kind of liked how it sounded so we stuck with it so there you go um yeah so company-wide yeah we had a three-day weekend we had a holiday off so we're, we're catching up a bit this week we were really like pretty caught up last week so we felt good going into the weekend but anytime we have a three-day weekend especially if it's not like an uber popular holiday where there might be other people still kind of working and doing their thing you know we know we're going to get a little more interactivity so um you know i've been a little bit busy 
today as we're recording, it's still Tuesday. So we're still kind of catching up from that. So that's the whole thing. Um, we're also in the middle of our, this is like super granular, not exciting stuff, but we're in the middle of our like annual benefits renewal stuff, HR things, doing our development reviews, lots of just behind the scenes inside baseball type things about what it takes to just operate as a company. Um, we care a lot about our people. So these types of things are involved. Um, we almost never talk about any of this stuff publicly because it's like, not anything that most anybody cares about, but caring for our team is super important. So we yeah. do spend and a we, good amount of time doing and that. And you kind guys of stuff. give us great benefits too. Not to brag or anything, but we like try. It, we it's try. solid, especially for a small company like Dan. Yeah, we, we, we absolutely do a lot more than we have to. I'll say that. Yes. Um, but we try to remain pretty competitive. We're not like doing anything ridiculous you know we don't have a slide in our building and you know these types of googly type of um you know benefits where you're like who are they trying to be um so we're not trying to you know do any of that crazy stuff but we're trying to do like no we really want people to have good benefits and be able to care for their families and be able to like not have to sacrifice working at a small company you know because typically you think like oh i'm gonna get paid less and have fewer benefits than i would at a big company which may still be true but we try to stay really, really competitive, um, which I feel like we are. So, um, yeah. And then also just in general, we've just had a lot of new products. Like January was pretty slow new product wise for us, but then like February, oh, it's just been common and common and common. So we have a lot of stuff that we're like, whoo, lots of stuff to photograph, lots of stuff that needs product descriptions and technical specs and just communication across the team and getting stuff in people's hands to experience. There's a lot of that that we've had to do and it's still common. So this is a pretty busy time for us just in general, uh, but in a really good way, like in an exciting way. Um, but it is, uh, you know, if ever you're asking questions to any of our team and you're like, why don't y'all know about this? It's like, okay, we have just a lot of stuff that we're trying to keep straight right now in terms of new products. Um, so, and timelines are still a little wacky with delivery delays and these types of things. Um, and then just in general, COVID update stuff, you know, we're keeping a close eye on that. We're looking at rates in Virginia. It's still a little high, but it is coming down other parts of the country, other parts of the world. I know it's up and down depending on where you are, but it seems like there's reasons to be optimistic on the horizon. So we are going to be very intentional about, you know, anything that we would change, but it's there, there is reason to believe that things could feel more normal in the coming six months or so than they have in the last couple of years. So we're talking, we're beginning conversations about what that will look and feel like in terms of obviously the whole company, but also in terms of like our video production and things like that. Um, so we're just kind of preparing for when all that makes sense. And uh, yeah, so it could be, could be reasons to be excited. Of course, things could always change. We've already gone through two additional variants that have thrown wrenches and things, and that's always a possibility as well. But, you know, we've navigated things pretty well so far, and I uh, feel really good about that. But, um, you know, at some point, things will stabilize, normalize to whatever degree this new normal looks like. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, who knows? So it could be exciting in the next couple of months. We'll see. Trying, I'm trying to be like optimistic slash realistic at the same time. I think Drew's with me on that one. All right. And I think that just about does it for us, Drew. I don't know. It does. Did we did we get to everything? I think we uh, did. I think that'll do it. Okay. We definitely did. We're approaching two hours. Cool. Well, we can wrap you, this you thing ready, up you, then. You ready for my fun fact? Oh, you have a fun fact? Yes. Tortoises have <laughs> stalks that are attached to their eyeballs. Like crabs, they just don't have the necessary muscles that have evolved to actually eject them so that they can, you know, move around like that. What? Drew, Drew, Drew told me this earlier, and I was like, is that real? I, I can't tell if that's real. He sold it so well. I still can't <laughs> tell now if that's real or not. I don't think it no. is. No. No, it is malarkey. Tis hogwash. Tis fish okay. stories. Okay. In the car yesterday, as we were going to the park, Ellie was trying to convince me that sea turtles have legs. They're just legs with fins on them. And I was I like, I mean, technically, no, you just... could say that about any thing with fins but like a turtle specifically because it like it is amphibious so it does sort of like walk on its fin and yeah so she was trying to convince me that they were legs i was like i don't think so and she was like well how many how many legs and arms do like cats have dogs have i was like no they're just all legs they're not arms she's like well what's the difference <laughs> between legs and arms and i was like you know 
I'm getting to the oh age where my, my kids are not, they're not asking like the innocent toddler questions. They're oh like, my gosh. they're like legitimately trying to like break my brain. They're like, right. watermelons aren't fruits. They're actually vegetables oh and legumes God. are actually monkeys. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> just like Ellie specifically tells me all these things that like, like nothing is what I thought it was. Oh just my God. And I'm just like, I don't know if that's actually true or if you're just like, watching some random youtube video that is just like fake news and i'm like you can no. tell her that uh <laughs> whales you can tell her that whales have legs how because they what? they still they still do have leg bones that are just like what? hiding somewhere in their body that they they don't they're not doing anything but the bones mm. are there just what? leftover just lower leftover evolution nonsense just chilling mm. out they got leg bones interesting just flopping around back there <laughs> is that true <laughs> yeah like all whales I don't know. After this food a nib thing, I don't trust anything that I know. Yeah, that's true. I don't know I, what is reality. I don't know about we, all whales, but are we in the Matrix right now? I feel <laughs> it's like definitely I saw the turkey. It's definitely, it's definitely the turkey cross, hammock. I feel zone. like I saw a black cat cross twice in the yeah. corner of my house. Uh, um, anyway, well, I do have a fact that I'll, I'll somehow segue this in there. So, <laughs> speaking of things that we don't really actually ever know what's happening, um, you know, Pluto. When we were growing up, Pluto was a planet. Mm-hmm. And then apparently it was a dwarf planet and now it's some kind of comet or maybe something. I don't know. I keep hearing various things about Pluto. But um, just for a perspective on how small Pluto actually is, um, Russia, the country of Russia, has a larger surface area than Pluto. So it's a teeny tiny little thing. It's a little that speck. It does. It's a little speck and it's very far away. So it's understandable. Maybe it'd be a little hard to figure out what Pluto even is. But I don't know. Maybe it's a heart. space station. Hmm. Maybe it's some sort of alien UFO that is hiding. I don't know. I can't even make it up anymore. I don't know what reality is. I think. I think we should end this pencast. Yeah. I think food <laughs> a, food a killed us. Yeah. Thirty. We're gonna the thirty we episode food a, thirty five. That was it. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. If you have questions. And more like questions for us, not just like, why are these guys even doing any of this? Yeah, we, we don't Who's have an answer to that. This? Don't ask those questions because we won't have any answers for you. But <laughs> if you have questions about pens or maybe other random things we've addressed, uh, you can go ahead and leave it in the comments. We would love to hear your feedback. Um, also, we need questions for future pencasts and we need pen ideas. So things that you want us to showcase. Um, yeah, you can definitely check out gulaypens.com for pen, ink, paper, needs and other various things like sealing wax or brass sheets random stuff related to pens um subscribe to our youtube channel instagram channel twitter i guess we don't spend as much time on that but we'll pop in every now and then uh you can also email us at pencast at gulaypens.com if you want to do that i already gave my fun fact but i skipped ahead of that and did that instead of the outro so now we are just gonna end this right on <laughs> <laughs>